Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for coming today. Um, I am excited to be to be. Can you see my 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 camera? Yes, we can. With me, okay. Um, so I'm very excited to have everybody here, um, and hopefully we're all going to have a good time today. Um, what I'm going to try to do today is I have this. Um, organized in four parts. Um, and I, I took the liberty to start off with a part that is called Fundamentals of Remote Sensing, which you probably were not expecting to necessarily get uh, because the session is learning mapping with a specific software. Uh, but from the perspective of having taught um, drone remote sensing for four or five years now, um, it's really critical, in my opinion, to get a little bit of, of basic fundamentals of a huge branch of scientific inquiry called remote sensing, which is basically what you're doing when you're mapping with um, drone to map. So if you bear with me through a little bit of this, I want to do a little bit of, of a really um, solid introduction to remote sensing, um, put this in context in terms of what we're doing when we collect data with drones is called remote sensing. So if you if you go to to any institution that offers a UAS or UAV, I'll be using these uh, interchangeably UAS unmanned aerial systems or unmanned aerial vehicles or drums. So any program that will offer training in um, how to use uh, how to collect data with drones, how to use that data, how to make that data into product is going to start off with this because you are doing remote sensing and remote sensing is one branch of geospatial technologies. It's um, it's sort of a parallel branch to GIS, which is geographic information science um, and GPS, global positioning system. So all of these come together in us um, getting involved in the science of mapping with drones, we are essentially doing small scale remote sensing. So what is remote sensing? Remote sensing is essentially any collection of data about um, or any measurement of an area or a quantity of, or a phenomenon or a process that is done without coming in contact with that specific thing that we're measuring, right? So everybody's familiar with satellites. Satellites are our number one source of remote sensing data. Then we have airplane remote sensing data. Um, and then of course we have drone remote sensing data or we have um, even weather towers. All of these kinds of things that collect information about, about things without coming in contact with them it's called remote sensing. So what is critical when we do remote sensing with drones is to basically ask ourselves three, three main questions. What platform do we need to use depending on what we need to get out of that data? What information are we collecting and in how much detail and how frequently? And the reason I'm pointing these three things out is because these form the basic components of the science of remote sensing. Um, so both satellites and drones, essentially what they do is they are platforms that carry instruments or sensors. You'll be hearing me refer to them as sensors that measure electromagnetic radiation. So anytime you put a drone up in the sky, right? Um, and you start taking photos of the ground because typically we'll be taking photos of the ground. Now there are people who do um, remote, who do drone, work to measure atmospheric processes but when we're collecting data about the ground what we're really taking a picture of is the reflected electromagnetic radiation that is to say the reflected energy coming from the sun so that energy from the sun hits the surface gets reflected back it interacts with the surfaces and what we're taking a picture of is simply that signature of how the sun's radiation interacts with the surface okay so whether again whether we're talking about satellite remote sensing or or drone remote sensing we're talking about essentially measuring something about the surface of the earth from above now when we work with satellites we we have to worry about the atmosphere there's a lot going on here um so so there so we measure not only the surface but also what happens in the atmosphere but with drones we by flying so close to the ground meaning our 400 foot ceiling, right? We basically just measure surface conditions at a given time and we remove those atmospheric effects. In remote sensing, that is critical because that's what makes drones so powerful um, in their various applications. So when I say electromagnetic radiation, what I mean is, um, again, incoming solar radiation, that energy coming from the sun, 
if we were to break that down into a spectrum, we call it the electromagnetic spectrum. It goes from very high intensity, low wavelength, gamma rays into X-rays, into ultra into ultraviolet rays, the stuff that we try to block out with sunscreen. And then we have this super, super thin um, section of that, that packet of energy that is our visible light, okay? That's what we perceive with our human eyes. And that's from about half a micrometer to 0.7 of a micrometer. It goes from blue into red. And then on the other side of that visible spectrum is infrared. Now, oftentimes on these drones that we fly, we have, all of them are going to have what we refer to as an RGB sensor. That's your red, green, blue. That's, it's essentially being able to take photographs of what we see with our human eye and what we perceive with our human eye. So when we see those RGB photographs from a drone, they are sensing only this tiny, tiny sliver of that energy. And then we have the drones that can take infrared photos or near infrared photos. So we, we call them, right? We put a multi-spectral sensor on, the, on those drones that goes outside of the visible. And then I'm sure you all know, we have even those thermal, the, the drones that have a thermal sensor that goes even farther out into, into this infrared portion of the spectrum. So this is, this is really important to couch what we're doing in this, okay? So basically, this is what we're sensing. We're sensing only visible light with a little bit of infrared. And sometimes when we have those dual thermal cameras, right, we go a little bit farther out to about 10 micrometers um, into the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, and so when I say that this radiate, this, this sun interacts with the surface, what actually happens is, so essentially imagine the whole, the, whole, the whole package, right? From blue to green to red and into infrared, it hits a surface. Say in this case, it hits a tree. That radiation that's coming from the sun is being used by the leaves on this tree to basically photosynthesize and to make energy and cellulose and so on and so forth. So the tree uses this energy to make food for itself essentially right but what it and then what it does is it absorbs in making this food it absorbs the green um, and the blue and the green the blue and the red and a very strongly sends back from the leaf structure reflects back green and infrared right or well, what happens is we see the tree as green but in fact because, but the tree actually reflects a lot more of this infrared radiation that we can't see with our naked eye. So we see the vegetation, we see vegetation as green. But as soon as we put a multispectral sensor on a drone and we fly it over trees, all trees are basically, um, they all show up very, very much more strongly in that infrared. So they would show up as a different color depending on how we show that infrared. And then there's um, the other important interaction, right? Of, of this radiation with the surface is with water. So basically what water does is, if you imagine all of this radiation hitting a surface, water uh, absorbs everything. That's why these arrows are so short, the infrared, the red, and the green. Um, and it reflects very strongly in blue. That's why water shows up as blue. So really all these colors that we're seeing, that we're sensing, that we're taking photos of, of with a drone are simply a result of physics. So there's physics, we have that solar radiation interacting with these different surfaces in different ways. So that when we actually go down to the bottom of it, what we can do with this, with these drone remotely sensed images that we collect with drones is we can actually take these, these um, colors, right? Because we essentially, right, I'm telling you here that we're seeing these colors. And you all know, if you've looked at a satellite image, you've seen water blue, you've seen vegetation green, you've seen sediment and so on. So you know the, how these things look. But what we can do and what's powerful about drone technology is that it gives us and it allows our students to, to tap into a very, very um, scientifically solid field of remote sensing in a very simplistic and, and sort of direct way so that we can take these colors and turn them into numbers. We can turn them into quantitative measurements. So what that means is I can take all of those colors in an image because they're basically stacked like pancakes 
and I can extract numbers. And those numbers simply represent where on that electromagnetic spectrum that I showed you earlier, that surface that we're taking a picture of falls. So imagine that you're taking a picture of, of an area that has a bunch of grass, a bunch of pine trees, um, so coniferous, right? And a bunch of oak trees, which are deciduous. So if I take a photo of an area that has grass, oaks, and pines, usually what we wanna be able to do with these drone images is basically extract some data from them, right? We're a we wanna be able to classify out what's, uh, what's grass, what's pine, what's oak, what's concrete. That's the number one use of why we do drone data collection sometimes. So the way we do that, the way we classify or the way we separate out these, these surfaces is by their spectral signature, by the way that they interact with that incoming solar radiation along the electromagnetic spectrum. I know that's a lot to say, but basically again, is how they, how they process, how they take in blue, or green and you see this is all vegetation what so what is it going to do it's going to spike in green because it uses the blue light like i showed you here in this graph vegetation essentially eats blue and red see there's a major dip here at the red because that's what it uses. vegetation uses that to photosynthesize to feed itself and then as i said before there's a giant spike in infrared and this is why it becomes incredibly necessary when we do say precision agriculture. So if you have students who are gonna be flying drones because they want to go and work in agriculture and make crop production better, well, the way they do that, the way they're gonna be able to apply drones to agriculture is by taking advantage of this giant spike in the infrared. So they're gonna be using a multispectral camera on that drone because all vegetation essentially spikes dramatically in infrared. And the reason it does is actually because it's a physical response of leaves. Um, they, they have something on the bottom of each leaf called the spongy mesophyll that essentially um, reflects back this infrared as a mechanism to keep the leaves cool. Okay, so they essentially, because infrared is basically heat, they have to stay cool. So they reflect, they send all of this part of the spectrum that hits them back. Um, so if you do precision agriculture, you're going to need a multispectral camera. And what you're going to do is you're going to plot out these different, say, imagine these are crops, right? So then each crop, as you can see, all of these look different. And they look the same here and they look the same here because they use it the same way but then they look very different here. And then they look also different here. So what that means is we can take that information where they look different, right, quantitatively and separate them out. And that is really powerful. That's what's powerful about remote sensing. You know, that's why, that's why there's no more, basically there will be no more agriculture in the future without remote sensing because you can go over your fields and take a bunch of photos and not only and, and extract, again, extract the quantitative data from those photos, right? Put the numbers down. And then you can say, not only this crop is cotton and this one's alpha alpha, but you can also say in this part of the field, this crop isn't gonna need phosphorus or this crop's gonna need nitrogen because we can see that stuff also um, in, in images. So, so that's the bottom line of it. Um, so, and then if you put up something a little bit more different than that, right? So if you, if you look at water, what water, this is the blue is for water, the green shape is for vegetation, and then this brown is for soil. So again, you see how very different these curves are now, right? So I mean, as I showed you here, vegetation all kind of looks the same, and there are very small portions of that spectrum where they look different, but when you start breaking it out and you start trying to, to tease apart soil, water, and vegetation, now the differences are dramatic, right? Water only reflects in the blue, that's why it shows up blue to us. And then you see the same vegetation uh, reflecting here in green um, and then in infrared and soil being, so that's why when we look at an image, bare soil shows up really, really bright in the, shows up to our human naked eye and see how high this curve here. So this is how reflect, how bright something is. So the higher on this, on this line, one of these curves is, the more that, um, that shows up. 
bright for us. So that's really um, what there is to it in terms of why we use drones to for different applications. And there are so many different applications that we can use drones for, right? So then in the process of, of using is that's how we can see what's what by essentially understanding how one surface reflects relative to another surface okay so here again the same thing drone satellite do the same thing so so there's the sun shining on everything here's buildings paved roads bare soil grass water trees right they are they're all getting hit with the same sort of incoming solar radiation but then they they sort of reflect back to your sensor differently okay so that was that and then the other thing that that was the mo the, the main sort of critical piece that i really have to get out there and make sure that 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 we know this is this is the context in which we do all this drone work it's it's a it's a big big context and and again anytime we do drone data collection you know the next step is to take that small drone image and compare it to a big satellite image and how we do this is through three important characteristics. And this is the only other background I'm gonna give you on, on the remote sensing part, um, because you will see these, these concepts everywhere. They show up when we do drone processing and drone to map all the time. I just, and I want you to, to recognize and kind of know, know what they are. Um, so, so again, when I talk about a uh, drone and a sensor, a drone essentially, or the UAS system is, is a platform, is the platform, is the thing that carries the instrument. And the instrument can be my RGB camera, or the instrument can be a multi-spectral camera, or a thermal camera, or it can even be a LIDAR, okay? Um, oops, so, so again, when, when we say drone or UAS, we can put any of these remote sensing sensors. They're all remote sensing sensors. They all do remote sensing. We can put even hyperspectral. When you talk about hyperspectral, you're talking about you know two hundred thousand dollars, and you're talking about some serious remote sensing that happens there. Um, and as you know, sometimes we we can put all these sensors on a drone. We can operate them in fleets, um, and we uh, and the the key is that we produce a huge amount of data that requires significant processing, um, and workflow is very important, as we'll talk about today. Um, and just a little, a little background here, um, and I'm sure you already know because most, I'm assuming everybody here is FAA certified and knows that what we're talking about in, in this class and what y'all are working with and what I'm working with uh, is a very specific type of drone, but there are many types of drones, right? So we have drones that, are, that span a huge range um, based on their size, the altitude at which they fly, and for, and how long they can fly for. So there are the tiny, tiny, mini, mini nano vehicles, the vertical takeoff and landing drones that fall, so, sort of fall right here in between, um, and then the what we call the low altitude, short endurance, the small UAS, the stuff that we're all certified to fly. Okay, so um, we, we know it's one hour, but they can fly longer. We all know they can fly longer than one hour, one hour as well. And then we have all the, uh, the low endurance, the low altitude, medium and high long endurance drones that we don't necessarily need to worry about. So, so again, to say that this is what we're talking about, the small UAS uh, low altitude drones. And so, as I said, we can put a variety of different sensors on drones. Um, some of these sensors, and there are two main types of sensors. I mean, that's all there is to it, simplistically put. Passive sensors, and these are the guys, your RGB camera, your multispectral cameras, your thermal cameras. These all collect what, what, we, what we call passive, um, passive energy, meaning they just take pictures of what any surface, so here's water, here's vegetation, here's bare soil. As I said, bare soil always shows up really bright in an image, and that's because it ref it's capable of reflecting all of that energy in the visible spectrum, so it shows up to our eye as bright white, as opposed to water, which absorbs everything in that electromagnetic magnetic spectrum and it shows up as dark, right? So these passive sensors essentially take these photos and we can then 
take the photos and convert them to biogeophysical quantities. We can extract vegetation information, chlorophyll A, we can look at soil moisture, we can even look at precipitation and temperature depending on what the sensor is. So that's why it's so cool to do drone remote sensing. Um, and then we have the active sensors, and these are basically think LIDAR here or radar, okay? So any sensor, um, and as you know, um, I, in my, uh, folks fly LIDAR drones, not so much radar, that's still very expensive and really heavy to put on a drone, but even I, I have a LIDAR sensor for one of my drones. So that is what we call an active sensor because it sends out a beam of energy, and it, it and records a uh, return from that, right? Um, and what's cool about these kinds of active-based uh, sensors and why they're gonna become increasingly important is that they can actually operate at night as well, just as, just as well. They don't need sort of that incoming, that they don't need the sun to be able to see information, right? They can collect information without having the help of the sun like passive sensors do. Um, and they, they also can penetrate through clouds and vegetation, which is super, really important. And that's why a lot of people use them, okay? So those are sort of my two main types of sensors. And then the other thing I said I, was, I would talk about is the, the three important concepts of spectral, spatial, and temporal resolution as, as it pertains to drone collected and satellite collected, collected data. So when I say that a sensor that we put on a drone is multi-spectral. It means, right, that it has multiple little cameras in sort of built into one, right, multiple little kind of openings. And that, that when I take a photo of the ground, instead of having one photo that combines, that, that sort of combines that red, green, and blue, so one RGB photo, I have uh, one in the red, maybe one in the one in the red edge, for example, which is um, an important one, in the green and one in the blue. So I have multiple bands, right? I'm able to, instead of just getting one photograph, for the same photograph, I get four to five layers of data, so to speak, but in different parts of the spectrum. Hence these breakdowns. See these breakdowns here? That means that if when I when a photo is being taken, instead of having a JPEG that that is just the one photo I got of that area, I literally have five. And I have one for each of these bands, but they have to be built that way, right? So that's why they cost a little bit more to have a multispectral. And then there's something like hyperspectral. And when they come from a satellite, these images have essentially, instead of having five to seven sort of bands, they have 200 plus, and th these are much more difficult to work with and process. Okay, so basically, the, and the reason we split up the spectrum like this, again, is back to those graphs I showed you, is because that helps us differentiate and separate what we're looking at. That's it, okay? Um, the spatial, when, when you hear the concept of spatial resolution, that's essentially um, the pixel size, right? And the spatial resolution of any image is um, how, what is the smallest unit being measured by my sensor? So if I put a drone up in the sky, depending on the elevation I fly that drone at, I'm going to get say two centimeters or, or one inch per pixel, right? That's the smallest indivisible unit that I'm gonna get out of that image. That's where I'm gonna extract my data from, or I can get um, four inches and so on and so forth. So that's what spatial resolution means, right? Um, and to kind of give you a comparison, because like, we're talking about spatial resolution, uh, most UASs were going to give us a spatial resolution of somewhere from, you know, one inch to, to about um, five or six inches, so two to 15 centimeters, whereas with satellites, right, and these are most, some of the most common satellites out there, um, some of the best resolutions are half a meter to a meter. That's absolute um, well, those are the commercial satellites that actually cost a lot of money. So th this is another reason, as, as highlighted here, of why drones are so important is because they essentially add, you know, to this kind of imagery. And this is the same exact location, but at a different spatial resolution, just to kind of highlight and explain that, right? So 
look at all the detail we can see in this image versus this 30 meter Landsat. This Landsat is the, the strongest and the longest archive we have in the world of satellite images dating back to 1972. So we rely very heavily um, on these kinds of data. But what we can do with, with drone remote sensing um, is that we can essentially, you know, get 10 picks, 10 um, centimeters per pixel. So we can zoom way in and we can sort of use drones um, to fill in gaps that we didn't um, that we didn't have before. And then the last concept that I that the temporal resolution piece, which is very important in remote sensing, is essentially the revisit. So in satellite remote sensing, that's how long it takes for a satellite to finish an orbit across the Earth and come back to the same area. We don't have to worry about that with drones, right? Our temporal resolution with a drone is on demand, meaning that if, if say, um, when you start doing this work with students and students want to um, to monitor, say, the the health of a wetland nearby um, your campus, right? So if that's what they want to do, they're going to have to collect data every say every month then that's that that's called temporal resolution how often the data gets collected um and so you know the, again for drones it's on demand it's however often it is needed um and sort of lastly here just to kind of kind of put it all back in perspective um here's a satellite here's an airplane and here's a drone right Again, all of this stuff, the reason we normally do drone remote sensing and we work with drones is because they fill in gaps that are left by, by collection from satellites and from airplanes. So, so you can kind of look at the important concepts that I talked about, that spatial resolution, the temporal resolution, um, and then, well, I'm not mentioning the spectral resolution directly, but it's under data types here, right? So typically from satellites, we get only multispectral passive data. There are some LIDAR satellites, but they don't function very well and so on and so forth. So because of that gap left by satellite remote sensing and the fact that satellites fly so high up in the sky and so on, um, then we sort of fill in the gaps with some of these other platforms. And UASs play a really important role in this. So know that when you're training students to become UAS, pilots and UAS data um, scientists, so to speak, they are well on their way to becoming data scientists because the UAS um, technologies and, and data collection and processing is part of a really much, much bigger thing. And so I think it's, think it's gonna be important to highlight this, that, that hey, you can actually go and take data from, from airborne, um, from airplanes, like the data that NOAA is collecting of our coast all the time. You can be able to work with satellite data. So, so they'll be building up this understanding of remote sensing in a direct sort of microcosm way. And then they'll be able to go in and apply it to some of the other much sort of broader, um, broader uh, pieces. Okay, um, so quickly to wrap up this, so why do we do again, this is it on the on the big picture, but why do we do drone remote sensing? I, I sort of highlighted some of these things. We can operate these drones over, over whatever study area we need at a very different scale. So we can have fly, fly big missions made up of multiple sort of drone flights. We can fly a fleet of drones, um, but we can also fly in very small and constrained areas that we otherwise couldn't with anything else, right? We collect very high spatial resolution data, and this is critical, right? That's how I've been trying to sort of bring home is that they are one piece and they, they give us that spatial resolution that is unparalleled and it's a revolution in what we can do with geospatial data. We can collect as frequently as we need to, and that's again, my temporal resolution. We can customize our missions and use different sensors depending on what we need. And we can actually carry them in a backpack even and fly where we couldn't put an aircraft. We can fly them in, in, um, in fire situations, in narrow canyons and so on. So these are some of the main advantages. And this is why, again, drone remote sensing as one component of remote sensing is really cool and really critical and I think an, an amazing thing for, for, for um, high school students to get into. But there are challenges and the main challenges are that because of how small these um, drones are, the sensors, the payloads that we can put on them are 
we're, we are limited, right? So we're limited by cost usually and, and the fact that they lifting those sensors. Um, there's still flux around the regulatory environment. Sometimes it's challenging to fly. So we're not having to worry about the entire atmosphere like we have to worry about with satellite remote sensing, but we still have to worry about, as you know, wind and rain and all that stuff. And then it's field intensive and difficult to georectify imagery sometimes. And it can be complicated and time consuming to process imagery, which is, I guess, why we're here, uh, why we're doing this. Um, so um, are there any, any questions? Um, I just had a few more slides with some example applications before we, we jump into um, the next hour. I, I would like to spend talking about how we plan a mission in order to get the data we need in, and what do we need to get in the field in order to actually properly process data. Uh, and I'll also do an introduction to um, <clears throat> photogrammetry, which photogrammetry is really the core of, of drone data processing. So really, I just wanted to, to make sure that I get across the point that I think this is really exciting that I think when, when you start teaching students this, um, we, 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 I think it's really important to keep track of the bigger picture of the fact that this is part of a, of a much, much bigger thing. Um, and there are tons of jobs and tons of, of, quite honestly, I mean, they're interested in where they're gonna be able to go job-wise, right, at the end of the day lots of jobs that pay really well in this field in this bigger field of of sort of data science remote sensing with them becoming interested in drones so there there is a question and the question yes, is can you explain geo rectify yeah so geo i will talk about that in in the upcoming so what that means is essentially when we take these pictures with drones, right? So the drone is flying, say, let's say at 400 feet. You take photos that essentially reside on your, on your, with your sensor, on your drone, with your camera, and they reside on your, on your memory stick in your drone. When you pull out that memory stick from it, so those photos were taken at 400 feet. When you pull it down and bring it back and you start putting it into say drone to map, which is only one of the many softwares we can use, um, the 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 software well it the software does kind of know because it, when your drone is flying and it's collecting this data it's also talking to a G, to to satellites that have gps on them I, I think everybody understands that right the only ways that these drones can complete a mission like we want them to do and they can collect this data in a way that we can then use is because they are talking to to gps satellites so at all times the drone knows where it is because it's it's got a gps antenna so that so then when a drone takes these photos it takes them at 400 feet but each photo has um the gps the latitude and longitude the gps location of where it was when it took the photos so what we have to do when we process the data is we essentially have to bring these images from 400 feet and stitch them on the ground and not only stitch them to the ground to basically get what the ground looked like whatever we were flying but we have to make sure that we stitch them to the ground in the right place in the right place relative to the the earth right um with the correct latitude and longitude does that beautiful. make sense beautiful uh, mission planning fundamentals and implications for data acquisition and processing workflows i know it's a it's a mouthful this is what we academics do but hopefully i uh so we are in part two of this training um and as i always tell my students uh if you came to this class hoping that we're just going to be clicking buttons you came to the wrong class because it's not what it's about uh, it's about really understanding the basics and then we're going to click some buttons well, you're also going to be clicking buttons on your own. That's the best way you're going to learn. So, so the, this this part is again what I just said: mission planning. So, how do we plan a mission that is going to give us processing quality data, right? Because we with drone to map, what we do is we process that data into a product. It's going to be an ortho. It's going to be a a. a stitched together photograph of the whatever we collected we call that an orthomosaic or it's going to be um a 3d product like the 3d rendering of a building um, it's going to be a digital surface model it's going to be a bare earth model it's going to be all these things that we're going to be able to get out of it but if we don't plan the mission right 
And if we don't collect the data right, then you're not going to get anything out of your data, basically, is all there is to it. So I'm here to tell you that. Uh, and hopefully then I'm here to tell you that um, we really need to do an in-person, how do you collect the data? Um, if you haven't done a lot of that, then I don't know where people are. I'm going to do a little bit of this and I'm going to take a break and hopefully some folks will talk to me um, and let me know people's experience with actual data collection. So as I said in the last hour, we're talking about small UASs and we have two types. I'm sure everybody knows we have the rotocopters, right? Most familiar, everybody's most familiar with the quadcopters, right? The ones that have four propellers, quadcopter. Uh, but some folks have um, a multi-copter, meaning you just have more than, than for those four propellers. <clears throat> and then we have fixed wing drones. Uh, this is a photo of me when I first acquired this drone back in 2016 with my then graduate student, Steele, who is now a drone operations manager at Firmatech, so really high up there. He's done really wonderfully in industry, and we just basically took this drone out, had no real idea, idea what we were doing, and we just went for it. Um, hopefully, you, you actually get to do it with a little training. So these fixed wing drones that I showed you on the previous slide, you may not have access to them, but just super quick, and I'm not gonna go through all of these, I provided the PDFs so everybody can read and go back and look at whatever you would like to look at more. But the bottom line is with these fixed wings, the reason I like my fixed wing UAS for a lot of different applications is because I can fly it for 59 minutes and 59 seconds, okay? So I can cover a much, 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 much larger area in less time. Um, it gets much better image quality um, and it has more control over the quality of that image because, for example, just that one drone I showed you, which is an EB, a Sensefly EB drone. Um, <clears throat> and by the way, if, you, if you, you're listening to this, um, the company that, that sells these is headquartered now, uh, the regional one is actually a Swiss company, but they have the North American headquarters are in Raleigh. Um, and they've been amazing about letting me borrow some of their equipment and test it and use it. So I would not be surprised if, if you were really a go-getter and you reached out to Sensefly Raleigh and said, hey, I really want to demo or I really want to test out this drone with my students. I bet you they would give it to you. Um, so just remember that. Um, and then they have all these sort of, they, you can... You can just have more control. Every time it takes a photo, this drone, it stops the propeller. So the propeller starts, stops for, for a second or I think it's a second or two, and then it starts back up again. So that means that, that, that any kind of vibration that might, have, might be happening uh, in, in the moment that the drone takes the photo, that vibration is gone. So that's why you get better image quality and more control over that. But of course, they're a little bit more expensive. Um, they require a little bit more training, but I'm here and I love to do these trainings. So, you know, it's not that big of a deal. Once you fly it a couple times, you get it. Um, and then they do no hovering. So they essentially take off, you program them. I'll show you how a little very briefly, and then they go do their mission. Rotorcopters, meaning our DJI kind of products that I know um, most people have access to, I and I do, they're cheaper to manufacture, they're more maneuverable, they actually do the vertical takeoff and landing, which is really important sometimes because we may not have the space uh, for these fixed wings to take the fixed wings, take off and land just like an airplane, so they need a little bit more space. Um, they have built-in obstacle avoidance, they can follow you around. I mean, they're getting really cool now, but they are very limited by their battery life in terms of the flight time and then uh, therefore, you can map much smaller areas um, and they can have small payload capacity. So, as I said before, what you're going to come across for the most part, say in the commercial DJI suite of products, for example, in terms of the sensors that we put on these drones, the cameras. When I say sensor, I mean camera, but it is a sensor. Um, are these RGB cameras that essentially obtain your traditional color imagery or video um, and they, what, what's cool about them is that they are the highest resolution. So that spatial resolution you get out of an RGB camera that comes with a drone, think Mavic, think DJI Phantom, that camera that comes with it is that RGB camera. It's going to give you really high spatial resolution. Um, it's going to give you very minimal spectral resolution, meaning they only give you red, green, and blue. 
but they are great for 3D um, and making um, high quality orthomosaics. And then we have, like I said, the multi-spectral where you have the RGB, the red, green, and blue part of the spectrum, as I showed you before, plus um, some infrared. And the reason we put the infrared on there, again, anytime you do any applications that involve agriculture, food production, vegetation mapping, you need to have that extra, um, that extra band on there, that extra um, little bit of the sensor, because hopefully that makes sense now as to why, because vegetation is appears so different in the infrared relative to everything else. So we can really tease out what's going on. And then the thermal, that's your farther IR. So it's about here. We look at temperature patterns across the ground, right? So hopefully that's that's, and what I'm going to try to do with my next hour of training is, is talk about and show you kind of how we process these data differently um, and things like that. So now I said we're going to talk about missions and we're going to talk about how we collected, how we set ourselves up for good data. So the number one thing that we always, con that we concern about ourselves with is spatial considerations, right? That's tied back to my spatial resolution I was talking about. So the number one question is, can I see what I want to see? Am I going out there to fly this region and collect X data? Can I see it? Can I get it? Is, it, is, this, is my resolution gonna be enough for me to get that? So this is an example of, can I see what I want to see? These are birds. So we had gone out to this Ellis Lake out in um, North Carolina here, <clears throat> to essentially see if we can use a thermal IR sensor to um, map out the extent of these um, of these um, bird colonies. Well, because, you know, the, the assumption was that if it's living and it's got blood moving through it, it'll show up on a thermal camera, right? Oftentimes we use thermal cameras for search and uh, for, for search rescues because we are able to pick up that temperature differential between a human body and the surrounding environment. Well, we tried to do this with birds and we found out that actually birds are um, not visible in the thermal because their, their feathers insulate them. That's why they have feathers. Well, I didn't, you know, didn't think of that. So anyway, so that's an example of can I see what I wanna see? Not with the thermal camera. Luckily we took RGB camera and we were able to count them and see them, but otherwise we wouldn't have. Um, <clears throat> And then, um, can I, am I flying high enough, large enough to, if I'm trying to map um, structure of the environment, urban, suburban, rural, open, dense vegetation, wetlands, this, that, right? So all of these things require us to think about how, where we fly and how we fly. And then, um, I don't know where everybody's at in space in North Carolina, but where I am in Wilmington, we have to worry about tides all the time. So if I do anything that even remotely comes close to the coast, you know, we have to worry about what we call environmental variability. Is there something happening in the environment like tides? Like, and the other really big one is sun angle. Never try to go collect data before 10 a.m. or after 2 p.m. unless you really have to because between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. is your your ideal window of data collection with a drone. Anything outside of the 10 to 2, um, 2 p.m., you're gonna have enormous shadows and that's going to complicate your data processing. So these are the kinds of things I'm talking about. So sun, sun angle, any other things that, that happen that, that move, tides and then clouds. The other rule, a big rule of thumb is go fly either on a completely cloudy day or on a completely sunny day. When you go fly on a day that has a broken cloud cover, so lots of clouds, but not everywhere, only some places, that's also going to create some, some, some pretty intractable shadow problems in your imagery. So sun, clouds, tides, if necessary, um, are really critical things to keep in mind when you're you're thinking about what you're mapping and how you're mapping. This is just to give you an example of the tides and the sun angle. Uh, so this is this is a um, high tide image of Masonboro Island, low tide, same day, same exact day, just a matter of hours. And you can see how different the image, right? So you can see the tide is out here and then it's in here. And this is the back barrier island and you can even, right, even back there, there's a significant difference. So again, depending on what you're after, you may want this one or you may want the other, the, the low tide, but you have to know what you're mapping 
to decide and to keep an eye on. And then the other important piece, really important piece, aside from these spatial considerations are my validation considerations. Do I need to collect imagery that then has to, uh, do I have to get ground control points for my imagery? Sometimes you don't. Sometimes you just don't need it, you know? If you're not looking to get, um, to get data that is, that has a vertical accuracy of less than two centimeters, for example, then you don't necessarily have to worry about that, that, that piece. Um, and this is an example of, of an RTK, a real-time kinematics GPS. These are very expensive. So chances are you may not have one. Um, these are about $20,000 if you buy them from Trimble. Now there are cheaper options, but I'm pointing this out because as you start going through some of the drone to map trainings, there's going to be some talk about ground control points. They are very important. And I'll tell you, unless you have one of these systems, an RTK, you won't be able to do it because any other GPS is not going to be um, accurate enough for you to actually use those ground control points to improve your imagery. So if you don't have an RTK, forget about it. You are only going to actually worsen and, and worsen your product by using something other than these guys, which have about a two centimeter vertical accuracy. Um, and we have tried this. I've done this. I've taken um, these ground control points with a variety of different GPS systems. It just makes it worse. It just makes it worse. So, so for most purposes, for most applications, you will be fine without getting ground control points. And you know why? Because the, the built-in onboard GPS for your drone is going to be more accurate than any other device other than one of these devices. Okay? So just remember that. And then the other thing that we need to worry about in terms of validation. So this is one. We call this, this is the georeferencing geolocation. It's not right? So you can still georeference your drone collected data without the ground control points. But again, if you need to pr produce super high accuracy, vert vertically speaking, products, then you might want to use one of these. But if you don't have one, don't bother. The second type of validation that we oftentimes do is what we call a, um, a radiometric accuracy calibration. And this is only for when you're flying multi-spectral cameras or thermal cameras. So if you plan on working and teaching with RGB cameras, don't worry about this either, okay? Because you're not going to have to do it. But if anybody has a multi-spectral or a thermal camera, you're going to have to, to essentially um, validate your imagery. And what it means is that you have to have some sort of on the ground target. And this is an example of a target that we use for multi-spectral cameras. And all you have to do is take a photo of this target before you fly. And then um, there's gonna be a spot in your data processing workflow where you bring this back and it essentially helps the drone calibrate what it sees from above to what was actually happening on the ground. That's all there is to it, okay? Um, but again, if you're not worrying about thermal or multispectral, you're not worrying about that. And then, of course, you have to think about any flight limitations. I'll talk about this, any access issues and so on and so forth. Um, and again, all of this is to say that these considerations of spatial, of environmental variability, of what um, validation you need to do if you need to do it, are critical for your data processing, for your imagery processing, and for the production of your mapping products, right? Your your various what you're going for. So, excuse, excuse me, me, can I ask a question? Yes. Hi, I was wondering when you was talking about the device used to help for ground the points. Um, what was the name of that equipment? You mean this guy here? Oops. This. Um. On the next slide that you were just on before, yes. Yeah, yeah, this one, uh huh, this one. Yes. That device that that allows us to to locate ourselves on the ground relative to the image. Yes. Yeah, this, this is a, a GPS, so a global positioning system device, GPS device, and this particular one is called an RTK, real time kinematics. 
and, and what it does is it essentially see this spot here that I have this ground control point at this uh, plastic thing on the ground. We okay. put we put these down so we can see them from the, we can see them in the image. And then when we are in the field, we bring the, one of these RTK systems with us, right? And this RTK system talks to the to to our global to our GPS is in the sky of which we have a bunch right um, and it essentially gets me a location a very 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 accurate down to centimeter accurate location of where this plastic ground control point was on the ground so then what happens is because I can see this plastic ground control in my image but I also have the location of where it was because I surveyed it on the ground. Then I can actually, if my image is maybe shifted this way a little bit, I can pull my image back that way and make it align perfectly. And that's what I mean by getting very high accuracy imagery. Does that make sense? Yeah, so with the, if the sense how far away is so. it's it's to essentially um so so i we know that we were standing in this spot right but it's one thing to know and it's another thing to have an exact measurement of exactly where you were standing in space and that's what it, this thing allows us to do and then like if if we use it in the imagery processing workflow and i'll show you when we go into drone to map um, where that go, where this comes. So for example, just imagine, I'm, I'm shifting over to drone to map for a second here, right? So just imagine these are all, I flew this mission, right? Each blue, blue spot here is a picture. Each blue spot, let me show you here, is one picture, right, that came from the drone. You see this? Yes. All right. So imagine that in this photo right here i have that plastic sheet i zoom into this and i can see it you see right and right. then i can see it in the image and i can say oh yes that's it that's right there where it is but what the what this device in the field allows me to do is say with 99.9 .9 certainty that's where i was so I can bring in, I, I can bring in basically a table that plots out my location. And again, mm -hmm. that's why I said you only need the art that you only need to use these ground control points. And I'll talk about them in a little bit more detail in a second. You only need to use these ground control points if you have a device capable of giving you very high accuracy, because otherwise your image is already look, do you see it right here? Do you see this guy? Yeah. Right. right. So you see it with your eyes in the image, and then imagine that you're bringing mm -hmm. it in as as a point, and say that the point that you're bringing okay. in that you, hmm, that you collected falls a little bit to the side, then you can move your whole image a little bit to the side. So it helps you get super high accuracy products. That's all. Uh, my question is, so I mean, when we take pictures, and then we can go into like drawing them out. We can put on the uh, the imagery where we actually see the satellite view. You know that was that was captured by GIS, right? And so, uh, is there a way? Because obviously, the, the image that we took may not exactly align exactly with the image on um, because you know the 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 the, the yeah. drone determined the GPS and the satellite pictures may not be exactly the same. Is there a way? on the um uh is there a way that we can move the image to align to yeah i know you do it automatically with these data points but i mean with these um uh these these I don't know, control, control, points. control points but but the question is is there so there i think that's all them i read something that you can actually put down five points out there somewhere just you put like cones or something and you can identify you can see those five cones in the picture and then you can realign. Is there a way of doing that? And okay, yes, that's what I was just saying. All so right. This is this is essentially what I was showing you. Where did I, I lost it now? Uh, where was it? Here it is. You see it? You can yep. see it in the image. But that's what I'm saying. Uh, it, you can see it in the image. But what you need 
in order to make that alignment that you're talking about, that you've heard about, which yep. I, I'm going to talk about that. What you need is one of these RTK systems. That's what I'm saying. If you don't have one of these, then anything else you survey this point with in the field, like another GPS device, it's not going to be helpful for, for you to align the imagery. It's easier to just let the workflow um, to just essentially trust the processing here and trust the GPS data that is associated with every picture you took. These are the pictures from the drone, and this is the satellite image, right? So this okay. is the, the, the base map satellite image as it shows up in drone to map for a random stack of photos. This is Wrightsville Beach, and this is the drone image. Now, it shows you that the drone image is right here relative and it covers, you see, because you can see these pathways, it's this, right? So, yes, you are able to use those, those ground control points, but only if you have a very, very high accuracy device to, to record their location on the ground with. And I know this is kind of bursting a lot of people's bubble. I, trust me, it burst my bubble in the beginning when I realized. Well, I, but it's the truth. I'm here to, I, I'm telling you this because there's no reason to go out there and start laying down GCPs and because you're going to have to fabricate these GCPs. In my lab, I basically fabricated them, right? Um, and you go out there and you lay them and you need a bunch of people to go put them out because you have to put them in different. So if this is my, if this is the project that you fly, you'd have, typically we tend to put one in the middle and then four in each of the outside corners. That's the ideal geometric placement. Now, is what I'm saying. If you don't have an RTK system, you are wasting your time. Okay, okay so my, 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 my question was though, so example, if you, if you took a picture of a building, I mean, uh -huh. you did a thing of a building and um, you know the, the building is fixed, it's not gonna move. I mean, it's the building, mm -hmm. it's fixed. So when it comes back on the overlay for like drone to map, when it comes to overlay and you have the, you have the base, was I think it's called base map or something. Yeah, this you is have the base map, map that you use the satellite the imagery. Uh -huh. But you'll notice that your base map and your pictures are not exactly aligned. My okay. question is, is there a way of taking that image manually and moving yes. it over top of, okay, that's what I was going to say. Yes. Because then, yes. now it's not, yeah, it, at least there's, when you see it, it looks close, right? That's what right. I'm saying. There is, and there is, but it's not necessarily done here in drone to map It's done okay. in RGIS, and I can oh. tell people what that, it's called, it's called, we call it rubber sheeting. It's a very easy process. Okay. You basically, when you finish processing your image, and if it shows off, if it shows that it's a little bit off, you have to, to and you, you haven't to use ground control points because you really, realistically, you can't at the scale at which you, you, you and the teachers are going to be operating because maybe the equipment's not there yet. Then you would take it and bring it into RGIS and move it. Literally, okay. you move it up or down or left. Or I know it sounds a little bit non-scientific, but sometimes it's a matter, sometimes it's literally a matter of a few centimeters, a few right. inches. So it's not a big deal and you know everybody does it wonderful that's great yeah. but yeah we're gonna come back so yeah so this is drawn to map by the way for the people that have never seen it and you see uh, it would be i think a little overwhelming if i just jump right into this so i'm gonna kind of keep i'm gonna start coming in here and showing you things as i start talking about the things that we're talking about but yeah so this is drawn to map i'm gonna close that this is your base map right so this this is an example that i'll be using at wrightsville beach uh, the base map can be changed, so you can have imagery, you can have streets, you can have topography. So any of these, this is what we call the base map, okay? So you'll see, um, and when you load up, I'll show you how you load the project. When you load up your project, it's going to give you the flight line. This, perp this um, orange line is how the flight went. And where you have one of these dots is where there is a photo. Okay, so as the drone is flying, it's gonna take a photo along a pattern. And again, this is why you're taking this class here today because it's one thing to take a drone out to the beach and fly it and snap photos. And it's a completely different thing to, have, to take a drone out to the beach to do a survey. This is a survey, right? To do a survey, 
And to get data that can be processed in, in drone to map or anything else, it has to follow essentially a pattern. It has to be a predefined pattern. And I'll show you how we set those up in order to, to get data that is geometrically consistent that we can then georectify, right? The thing that you were asking me about last, last hour so that we can align it to where it was in the, in the real world. But I'll come back to this. Okay. Any other questions? This is good. I, I would like folks to ask questions like this. Please interrupt me. Don't feel bad because I do not see the chat. Okay. When, right. when, you're using, when you're using RBG, is there a minimum megapixel to use for your camera? Um, the, the RGB cameras are going to be whatever they are by manufacturer, right? So you can't, you don't necessarily, well, I mean, they're going to, though currently most of them are 16 to 20 megapixel, the Mavic and the DJIs, which depending, and I'll talk about this in a second, depending on how high you fly, that's how you modify your spatial resolution. So you, you control that based on your flight height. Does that make sense? So whether you get one inch at the end of the day or you get four inches, it depends on if you fly at, uh, um, you know, 200 feet versus 400 feet versus 100 feet, things like that. What about the angle? Uh, if you're doing 3D versus, if you're doing 2D, it's easy, right? Straight 90 degree angle, you fly it, no big deal. Got it done, not a problem. Okay, but when you want to get the. About, that's coming up. It's coming up. Okay, okay. All right. Don't want to jump ahead. That's okay. I mean, it's coming up, and I will be talking about sure. this literally. Uh, but the angle, yes, you want to do a little bit more oblique angles, and typically up to 70% okay. is what, what we found. But yes, I will talk about that in a second here. So, anyways, all of that is to say that it, we're going to get an ortho mosaic, right? An ortho. For short, you're going to hear them referred to as orthos. Ortho uh, means orthorectified, and that simply again, um, and the ortho comes from your lat long, so your sort of location relative to latitude and longitude. When I say lat long, so your location in the world relative to what we measured that location is relative to the center of the Earth, right? So, so essentially, you can be at the equator at 45 degrees latitude, 90 degrees latitude. So these are called orthogonals. And so then essentially they land the the they landed their names over to an ortho mosaic, a mosaic that is um, fixed to real world coordinates. And then this is an example of what we call a digital surface model, a digital terrain model. So typically um, you're going to have you, you may have a lot of artifacts and things going on, especially if you're flying over water. But what I want to point out here is that when you're processing the imagery, RGB images, for the same exact surface or for the same extent, for the same area, when you fly an, an RGB mission, you're gonna end up with like 400 images for multispectral, you're gonna have 4,000 and for something like thermal, you might have twice as many as that. So just remember processing time exponentially goes up if you're processing something other than RGB. Okay, so mission planning, here we go. I'm sure everybody, and again, I don't know what experience people have, but I put these resources in here just in case you're new to this and you really have to start kind of from the bottom. So I'm kind of, hopefully this is helpful. So I use Sky Vector or Before You Fly. I'm sure everybody has different preferences to figure out if the area is legally flyable, if I need to put out a NOTAM or if, if I'm within a certain distance of an airport, so on and so forth. So whatever you like to use, okay, I do that. Then I ask myself, do I have permission to operate within that space? Is it private property? Have I asked people, uh, you know, we can't fly over non-participants, we can't do this, we can't do that. All of those things are here. <clears throat> um, and we need to, to, to pay attention to them as we plan. Then I ask myself, do I have enough time to land and to take off and land? Again, if you're not flying a, a fixed wing, this is not a good, this is not a big deal. Uh, but even for, for rotocopters, you know, you definitely wanna make sure you have enough time, uh, space to operate. And then this is probably not very relevant. Again, I don't know where everybody's from, but if you're out, uh, if you live out in the mountains in the North Carolina mountains area, you really have to think about this one, right? If you don't, then you don't have to worry about it. But if you do, um, you really want to think about the topography in your in your flight area. 
because uh, we've had it to where you know you fly over a ridge you've basically lost connection with, with your drone depending on where you are and you also can have you can plan a mission and you can plan it at a certain elevation and then you can run into something that's way higher than you anticipated just because there is a mountain or a ridge or something in the way so so definitely an important consideration if you operate in terrain in areas with terrain and then I always, I mean, maybe this should have even come a little sooner because this is probably my second thing I look at is I like to use the UAV forecast app. I put a link for it here. What's the weather going to look like? And you can actually, UAV forecast has never failed me. Um, it actually not only pulls in your weather gusts, and this is incredibly important. It's very, it's, it's turned out to be generally very reliable in my experience. But the other really cool thing and important thing that it does for us UAV pilots is it, it estimates the satellites that are going to be locked where are you going to go fly and I don't know if anybody's had this problem before I have had this problem I have tried to you know I had everything ready to go I set up ground control points I had a team in the field and um, and I was close to Sunny Point down here in Brunswick County and I just couldn't fly the drone just you know I basically put it up in the sky and it wouldn't go and it's because I didn't have enough satellites locked in when by satellites, I mean GPS satellites, the stuff I keep ha uh, harping on, the, the, the satellites that give us the location, that give us the ability to take those pictures and turn them into a product that is, is in the right spot in terms of the real world coordinates. So pay attention to that. Okay. Uh, and then other factors to consider, of course, are going to be, are you taking video or are you taking still images? If you take video, um, the processing for that video is a whole different beast. Um, it's called full, full motion video. It's, it's again, it's a, it's a different beast altogether. What we're talking about here today is only processing still images, right? So, so, so there's that, but you can fly video and do stuff with the video and extract stills from it and so on and so forth. I don't do that very much. Uh, think about your desired spatial resolution. And here's another example of what I was talking about. If this is the reality you're flying, what do this is going to be the data you get out so on the on the left is your reality on the right is the data you're going to get out right if your reality has features that are a certain size and you fly too close to the ground then you're going to end up with with data that looks like that it's not going to give you what you needed okay so this is why i keep bringing this up it's very important to really consider the, the size of what you're flying and then we have to think about how we cover the area, the image overlap, um, and of course, the always rule of thumb, you take off with the wind and you land against the wind. I hope everybody knows that. And then you ask yourself, what equipment am I bringing out? I'm bringing the drone and my sensors. And then um, am I bringing the RTK, my GPS unit? Am I bringing um, a MiFi? So again, when you bring one of these RTKs, and this is why I'm saying the cost is fairly prohibitive because you can you don't only bring a GPS unit, you have to bring a mobile hotspot because you're having to connect uh, over the internet to a real time network in North Carolina to do a differential correction. So it's all, um, but are you bringing ground, ground control? Sorry, this should say ground control points. Ground control points, radios, binoculars, backup propellers, rubber, whatever, all these things you need right um have you done your pre-flight inspection have you have you done your uh cruise uh, your maintenance all of that stuff and then you ask yourself things like do i have a, how accessible travel time weather and environment all these all these other things and i have a little tips and tricks here for gcps ground control points um if you need to to use them here are some good lessons and then um, things can go wrong. I mean, things do go wrong. It's usually pilot, pilot error, but it can also be too windy. Um, I've had that happen. I've had loss of communication with my, with my drone. It, I had a runaway drone situation once, a flyaway. Um, so, you know, you basically have to be prepared for these things to happen. Um, and oftentimes your fail safe, what I've kind of come to, to realize is you know, you always make sure you have your return to home set, make triple sure you have your return to home set, your home point set before you do anything. And then, you know, your your return to home button is gonna be your fail safe in a lot of situations when, when things go wrong. And 
Um, and there's that. All right, so, so those are the kinds of questions you ask yourself. So really most important are gonna be weather and the before you fly slash sky vector app uh, where you check things out and you're thinking about your logistics in the field. And then how do you plan a mission? So all the data you're gonna ever be processing in drone to map is gonna be collected like this, uh, like I said, at a certain altitude that you set along a, a flight path, right? So whether it's a fixed wing or a rotocopter, it does the same thing. It's gonna go along a flight line, it's gonna turn, it's gonna come back. Now, if you want a 2D product, you're only gonna fly something like this. You're gonna fly a mission that is essentially cover the area, come back, you're done, land. If you wanna get 3D products out of your data, you're gonna fly a mission, so you're gonna fly your lines this way, and then you're most likely gonna fly them perpendicular. I'll get to that in a second. What you what, what you're watching for as you as you're planning this is your overlap, and we have two types of main, two main types of overlap. One is called front overlap, and that just refers to the overlap between subsequent photos along the flight line, right? So as the flight progresses this way towards you, or like this way. So it's gonna, you're gonna have a photo here, a photo here, a photo here, right? The overlap between these photos is important. And then there's also gonna be overlap between this flight line and the next one. We call that the side overlap, right? And you'll see in a second why that's super critical. <clears throat> so here's an example of a mission plan in Emotion. Emotion is the software that um, I use for my fixed wing drone. So here you see the same exact idea. I don't know why this is cut off, but this is my takeoff point right here off the map. And then here comes the drone. It's gonna follow this line, this path. And again, the only way that the drone can follow these paths is because of the GPS on board, okay? So they have an onboard GPS, they do all this stuff. They maintain the altitude. So this is 135 meters above mean sea level. This was, I didn't fly this, this was just an example. Um, and then here's the actual area that you're mapping. You always map a little bit outside of that and so on and so on. Okay, so, so for instance, and this is gonna be the same in another, the resolution, you, this is gonna be your spatial resolution. So this is about 2.8 centimeters per pixel with this later, lateral and longitudinal, this lateral overlap is side overlap, longitudinal is frontal overlap. So there's inter, uh, interchange, interchangeable terms, right? So here you can see those, that's basically some of the core things that you're ever gonna be needing to set, is how high am I gonna fly? This is being uh, flown at, say, this altitude, and what my overlap is. Um, and then, so the height, the flight height is gonna give you your spatial resolution, how, how fine the data will be. And then this overlap will give you um, just how accurate your final products are gonna be. Okay, so here's another example, same thing. So here's an area I'm flying, um, that's how much time it's gonna take, how much area, and so on and so forth. And then um, this, is, this is what Pix4D captures. Pix4D is the company that makes drone to map So drone to map is, everybody knows that it's made by Esri, but it's made by Esri via um, an agreement with the company called uh, Pix4D, which actually makes the, the full-blown version of the software. And so if you're processing something in, drone to map, this is probably your best bet for flying those missions because it's gonna be collecting exactly the data with the information that you need to, to load your data into drone to map and hit go for processing. Okay, so this is the screen. Hey, Dr. Lissa? Yes. Uh, yes, yeah, so, <clears throat> just let you be aware of that. Uh, so the North Carolina High School program has a partnership with uh, what used to be Kitty Hawk, which is now Aloft, uh -huh. but they just changed their name. And uh, Aloft uh, has a, uh, they already have a capture tool involved in it. We get that, our, all of our teachers are using Aloft for all of their data, all of their tracking, everything. And built into the Aloft is a drone link modified mapping process. So they're actually using drone link uh, is what they're really, it's not really, it's a, it's Aloft, but it's really drone link. But that's what the tool they're using. It doesn't cost them anything. They get full access to it. So that's, and they, and all of their data is tracked in the same aloft system, including their flying times and everything. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. so, yeah, I just okay. let you be aware of that, that. So, so therefore when people are watching this and see Pix4D, it's going to be slightly different, but not much. Yeah, yeah. I mean, 
It's well, basically the same process. I just want them to be aware. It turns out I have the Aloft. I had I used to have the Kitty Hawk app on here, so it actually automatically. Yeah, yeah. I didn't know that. I would have done a screenshot out of that's the okay if I had known. But it doesn't matter. Look, the point is, it doesn't matter what screen capture. Uh, software you use the stuff i'm talking about here is gonna be the same whatever the app is you're gonna open that app and have the option to map a 2d polygon or a 2d map right or yep. you're gonna have the option to map a 3d model or you're gonna might have the option to do a 3d circular model these are gonna be basically your options iris irrespective of which in which app you're flying the only so, other yeah, the yeah. only other thing is that that one of the problems that we found with Pix4D as an example, uh, the 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 capture software has to recognize your drone. So if your drone is not one of the ones that they recognize, you can't use Pix4D. Mm. You can't use, and that's the reason why we've gone with Drone Link, because Drone Link uses what's called virtual sticks, which okay. is an entirely different process. What what and drone actually, you have? and yeah, therefore it has a lot more drone availability for the okay. drones that we're using like it does include uh uh it does include uh mavic air 2s it includes okay. mavic air minis it includes a lot of those because it does a virtual stick application as well as pix4d has a limited they're much more i mean like my driver mavic air 2 and it won't work on pix4d they don't have a they don't have an application for it yet but it does work on drone drone link but, so, okay, I hear you. I hear you. I, yeah. I I didn't know, but basically, the bottom line is you're gonna fly a 2D polygon like this or a 3D model if you're gonna use that data for mapping. Okay, and no matter what the screen looks like, it's gonna look different than this screen. I we we get this point now, but all I wanted to to bring home with this was that you set the resolution, uh, you set the elevation at which you're flying. You agree with me? You set that up, you set your area, the polygon that you're mapping, and then you set how high you fly. And then you're also going to set your overlap. And that's going to give you this uh, 3.5 centimeters per pixel. That's basically what you're setting when you go out and fly. And really, again, I only have those two screenshots from Pix4D just to kind of show as an example, right? But it can be anything. And, and but what you really need to be concerned, again, uh, with is Here's my area of interest. Here's the here's what I want to fly. Here's my my polygon, right? And here's my flight line over that. And how high am I flying? And what is my side and frontal overlap? You as the pilot in command have to make those decisions. Okay. And the, again, the elevation. And the, over, the elevation is going to give you your ground sampling distance. I'll talk about it in a second. And then the overlap is going to give you the ability to then turn these products into really high resolution 3D products. So, so how high you fly will give you what is called a ground sampling distance. That's what it shows up, right? You see it right here in the app, GSD. So I want to make sure that if people see GSD, they know what it is. It's your ground sampling distance. And it's again the resulting pixel size of your image, and that's determined on by how high above the ground you fly and the focal length of your camera. That's specifics. You really don't have to. You don't have to set that up or do anything like that. Um, but it's essentially the number one predictor of how how good of a spatial resolution you're going to get. And here's an, a set of examples of different cameras that can exist on these drones, right? They all have a certain focal length, the, the distance there inside the camera that they can, um, of how they how they sense. And that that and, and the height at which you fly uh, will determine your pixel size. Um, okay, so then you take, so then, you, see, so you have two types of imagery, and you asked me about this. I think it was David, right? You asked me what happens when you fly 90 degrees straight down. Those are called nadir images. Straight down, you can get a certain amount of coverage, right? And you're gonna get, you know, a certain type of product. And then sometimes you, when you want to get a much more defined 3D model of whatever area you flew, you want to fly a little bit oblique. You want to fly at an angle, right? Um, and either way, whether you're flying like like that, straight down, or a little bit with an angle, you're still going to be able to to put that data into a photogrammetry, into a software, 
and then get a 3D model. And oh my gosh, it is 9, 10, uh, and maybe I should I should start stop here with this um, and come back to to photogrammetry in a second. This will won't take me long, and then we're we're gonna start um, looking at some more. Um, delve really into the workflow. So really going to start delving into the workflow. But um, are there well, any like, questions about how you set up data collection or the mission plan or anything like that? Again, the whole point was to underscore how important it is to set that up right, to think about what you're what you're collecting, how high you fly and what your your uh, front and side overlap are to get good data. We got to a really sweet spot where we're going to do a, just a, about 10 more minutes of sort of theoretical um, conceptual stuff. And then we're going to go start processing some data. Um, I just want to make sure at this point that everybody has access to a drone to map in case if you want to open it on your machine and follow along. Um, if you do want to follow along with the same exact data that I'll be that I have sort of chosen to do the demo for for you today, just for that purpose. Um, that link I put in the chat to the Esri virtual campus, right? Uh, I'll, I'll put that in again, just so everybody, while I still do these 10 minutes, wait, I got rid of the chat. Okay, so here's the link again. Um, everybody should have access to it. If you have access to drone to map, use exactly the same credentials to log in here. Um, and then specifically, once you log in here, what I'd like you to do is use this link to this link that I'm going to paste in the chat now also. Well, you should be able to click on that and it'll pull up a specific getting started with drone to map, which is a training. And what I'd like you to, to do if you can, maybe during the break, is um, just download that data, okay, if you wanted to follow along. But you don't have to. I mean, it may actually, I didn't want to send this ahead of time because I don't really necessarily think it's the best idea. Then it might just get too complicated. I think if you just follow along with what I'm showing um, and then try to do the training on your own, uh, I think that would actually be better. You'd be better off doing it that way. But it's up to you. That's what I'll be using as the data, as the base data as we talk about this. So, <clears throat> so to wrap up, um, the, the the really basics, what we do when we collect data pictures with drones is we engage in a subset of remote sensing called photogrammetry. We're essentially mapping things from photographs, okay? So again, without touching, remote sensing technique, and it's a method of measuring objects. So, so photogrammetry is what we use to stitch together photos that are taken uh, with these overlaps that we just kept talking about, the front and side overlap. The front and side overlap essentially allow us to view the same thing on the ground from different angles. And that is the fundamental sort of um, measuring technique and the fundamental approach for actually being able to measure objects from a drone, okay? So, and the principle involved here is exactly the same principle that's involved in measuring location with a GPS and it's called triangulation. So we essentially triangulate, meaning we put angles together, right? We need at least three angles to make a measurement. That's hence triangulation. So we're viewing the same thing from multiple angles and that's what the overlap between our pictures allows us to do is view the same thing from, from this angle. As the drone moves over here, we're gonna be viewing this thing from behind as the drone passes. And then as the drone comes back on the next sort of flight line, we're gonna be viewing this thing from this side and on the previous flight line, we were viewing the same thing from that side. So that's the idea, right? We were viewing the same thing from multiple angles. We triangulate between them. So there you go. So the, these angles are called lines of sight. So we're pointing to the same object from different lines of sight, right? So then we can mathematically intersect those those lines of sight, those rays, those angles, and produce a three-dimensional rendering of what we were seeing. That's all there is to it. Okay, so it's essentially, so here's a visual example of how it works. Here's a 2D, a two-dimensional photograph of the same thing from multiple angles. I'm viewing this thing from this angle, from that angle, right? You get the point, 2D photographs, 
they were taken right right here see from these different angles these different lines of sight and then when you stitch them together you can get a 3d rendering of the object and this is photogrammetry it, it means measuring things right from photographs and again, the, the essential component of photogrammetry and of stitching drone images together is first you have to take the photographs and you have to make sure that they are good photographs. That's the number one rule of thumb, right? So we have to make sure that what we're viewing is the field of view, meaning that what we're viewing is what we want to view, the focus, that the camera is properly focused. And all it takes when you fly a drone and you want to focus the camera and it, it looks like it's a little bit blurry, you just usually touch the screen of your 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 device that you're collecting with, a phone or, or um, a tablet, and it focuses. And then the exposure, right? The exposure meaning you don't want too much light or you don't want too little light. You just want that exposure to be just right. I usually leave it at zero. But if it's super cloudy, you may bring up the exposure just a little bit. Typically, but typically all really um, is you have to make sure you get good quality photographs. If they're blurry, they're not going to work. You're not going to be able to make a good 3D rendered product from them. So that's number, number one rule of uh, um, so photogrammetry is the photos, good quality, reliable photos. And then you're doing the, the measurement, the metrology in photogrammetry, right? So you get the point. So, so for each... For each 2D photograph, there's going to be some metadata, and that metadata is going to be your location, usually, and, and a few other things. The pitch and roll and yaw of the of the drone is all uh, recorded in the metadata of each photo. And these kind of these measurements come together when we process, when we stitch the imagery together. They come together to give us that 3D rendering. So we have three types of aerial of, of sort of aerial collected photographs. We have the straight down vertical. So what I have here is a really old, like I just think these are a really cool old photo. And then here's my camera taking the photo and this is the field of view. So the more vertical my drone, my camera is pointing, the, sm the, the smaller the field of view. So by field of view, again, I mean how much I can see down on the ground. So if you want, um, <clears throat> A really high accuracy product, you want to do a straight down vertical field of view, but you're going to get a smaller area. You're going to cover a smaller area. And then you can get oblique photographs with no horizon. These are the ones that are going to give you a little bit more area on the ground um, and also going to work well for, for 3D products. Or you can do high oblique, which we don't do for missions. You would do this with a little bit of sky in it. Uh, but you're capturing a lot more ground. Your field of view is bigger, but you're not going to be able to stitch these images. Um, so vertical is typically the most important type of photograph we can take for photogrammetry purposes, for the purposes of getting reliable products, okay? Because they have minimum distortion, okay? That's the bottom. So, so you're just going to not have that side distortion. Um, and again, it's going to give you um your your ground sampling distance okay so that's all that you need to know about photogrammetry just know it's a thing that we can do uh, with photos taken from multiple lines of sight and so the other really key component for processing data is how do we do this right how do we take these photographs we, we just said that photogrammetry allows us to ex extract measurements from photographs it, well, how we put those photographs together into a product is through an algorithm called structure from motion. Okay, so structure from motion photogrammetry is essentially a field that's been around for a long time. And the idea is, again, exactly the same. I have a little bit more background here than you probably want or need or care about. But it's, again, it's the idea that we can not only take photographs of something and stitch them together to get a 3D rendering, but we're taking those photographs from motion, in motion, okay? So structure from motion is the algorithm that runs in the background in drone to map that allows us to stitch the photos together. And we essentially, we, we are able to, to create structure from the motion of a camera. And the idea is the same, that as the camera is in motion, we have these photographs. And from these photographs, we calculate we extract essentially each spot where there was a photograph is a point in a cloud of points because that's what that's all there is to it. And then we take each of the photos as as a as a point in a cloud of points, so to speak, 
and then we we um, interpolate those lines of sight. We we kind of stitch them together to create a colored overlay. And this is like a very over. This is a very very generalized workflow of what we're going to go through in in drone to map. And like I said, this has been around a lot. Um, it's used in a lot of different applications. And the schematics, so how this works, again, is here's your image one, here's your image two, image three, image four, right? And what I just said is we're viewing the same, same look at this point here. You see this point? I have four lines of sight to this point. So those are my lines of sight to this one specific object, right? that I am getting from multiple angles with my drone as it's in motion, right? That's why it's structured from motion. So from that motion, from this drone moving, so this is the line of my moving camera, from this movement, I can recreate this structure, okay? So, um, so what we really are, are kind of Mathematically, what well, we are not, thankfully, the software does it, but the software mathematically resolves for the position of the camera in the sky, right? Using the GPSs, the, the onboard GPS on that drone, and then the, the orientations, these lines of sight, and then the geometry of that, of that scene. So that's the basics of kind of what goes in there. Um, and again, this is just a write-up that I did to kind of help folks walk through it, but we essentially create these camera positions and then we, we derive a point cloud. So I wanna introduce this idea of a point cloud because maybe it's a little difficult to, to wrap one's head around. And when I say a point cloud, this is what I'm talking about. You, you see my screen, you see these, these locations of where there was, there's a drone photograph, right? I showed you that each of these, each of these locations, right, has one photo. And then you may wonder, well, there are only, you know, say 30 some images in here. How is that a point cloud? Well, this is what we're gonna, we're gonna unpack here. So each of these photos has, is one photo on the ground that has a certain amount of overlap. So there's a certain amount of overlap between this photo and the next photo and the next photo and overlap between this photo and that photo. Okay, that overlap allows us to create a 3D product. But what, what I mean when I say that we generate a point cloud is that, check this out on this slide. So look at this feature that I have highlighted in red here. Let me make it back big again. Sorry, I should stop doing that. So these features, you see, this is the same exact feature that I have highlighted in every one of these photos. What this feature is, is a unique it's essentially some kind of a unique feature in the overall giant photograph that I got from that one position of the drone in motion that has what we call these key points. I mean, these unique features that we can view, we can identify in the one image and in the next image and in the next image and in the next image as unique as identifiable. And this, these key points are what actually become our point cloud. Okay, so I know this is, and I'm gonna come back to this. I'm gonna show it to you in a different, in a couple different ways, because if you don't get your head wrapped around this, none of the processing is gonna really make any sense, um, right? But, but this, this is the idea, right? That in each photograph, we can identify this as a feature and this becomes a point that is then identified again, but from a different angle and at a different scale. By scale, I mean you're more zoomed in, more zoomed out, right? So this point gets identified um, one by one in these different images and it becomes sort of a, I have it identified here, one point in the cloud, identified here, another point, another point, another point, and then I go again, the not me, the software does this. And you'll see when we process data, this portion of the processing where these key points are being identified in the image take the longest. It takes a really long time because the structure from motion algorithm, this SFM, is literally is it's like a comb it's sifting through the image through these pictures over and over and over and over again we set up how many times it does it 
but it goes through the images and it finds these key points, these unique features. Okay, so this is going to be one. This is going to be another one. This is going to be another one. This is going to be another one. This is going to be, you get the point. So we end up with millions of these points in a cloud of points that essentially hover up there in space. And that's what allows us to, to stitch the images together and to get the 3D product that we're so interested in. Does that make sense? As a kind of an, forget about the scale invariant feature transform, that's the actual algorithm that identifies these key point descriptors in multiple images, regardless of the scale that at which they occur. So this is the critical piece, and I'll come back to this. Um, so anyways, then the bottom, the bottom line though, is that to, go, to do a good, to, to create a good survey that will work for this structure from motion algorithm that we run in, in drone to map, we have to make sure that we either, that we have essentially, if this is the area, right, so it has some topography, we want to cover, again, the same area from multiple angles. That's the idea, okay? Multiple, multiple angles of the same area. Okay, so I'm going to stop with this. I'm going to come out of that, uh, and um, I'm going to really go into, into, into the stuff now. All right, so, so here we are. This is drawn to map. Right. I'm sure you've opened it. And if you haven't opened it, opened it, it's OK. This is basically what it looks like. Um, we have a contents page here on the left. So these are the contents of what shows up in the image. Right. I can take this off. I can turn this on so I can I can toggle these layers on and off. I can toggle off the images. I can only keep my flight line um, and so on and so forth. So this is example data. This is called a base map. Um, as I'm hovering around this base map, you see these numbers changing. These numbers are my X and Y coordinates. These are my latitude and longitude. And we can see this is Riceville Beach. We are about 77 degrees um, longitude west and about 34 degrees latitude north. This is the stuff that ensures that your data is in the right place, okay? All right, uh, and then up here we have the other sort of, uh, we have the information. So this is where, where we do all of our processing from. We, we toggle on the data, uh, we explore, we zoom in, we zoom out. I'm zooming in and out with my mouse, with my little round um, wheel on my mouse. That's a good way to zoom in and out. I definitely encourage people to have a mouse when they do this kind of work. Um, okay, what else? And then, um, again, here we can load up different base maps. Um, so we have a selection. So I can use that to select this point and show you quickly what that opens. So that's that's called a pointer, a selection pointer, right? It's the same thing that I opened before. I can open images. Um, and let me see, can I click on the flight line? As, a, as an object in here? Probably can. No, not really. Anyways, so that's, you get the point. And then this allows me to navigate through my scene. Um, and then and then we come in here, and this is called processing. This is where the magic is going to happen, okay? And you can see there's not that much going on here, right? You see a manage tab, you see an options tab, and then you see a start tab, and then you see something called log and report. We're going to come to these, but basically, um, options tab opens this scary looking thing, right? And the scary looking thing that is being opened under options also appears here on the right hand side of your screen. <clears throat> okay, so this is going to have something called initial processing, dense. 3D products, 2D products, and post-processing. So these are basically, you see, these are basically the same things that you have up here. Um, and what these signify is the order in which your processing workflow is going to go. So your processing workflow begins with you making some initial settings. So you can get to it that way, or you can get to it by clicking here. So if you have Pix4D, uh, sorry, drone to map open, and you click on this initial, it's gonna, it's gonna bring up all of this. And you're gonna scroll through this and be like, what in the world is all of this, <laughs> right? Uh, but, and this is, this is what I'm gonna do that over the next two hours. I'm gonna, I'm gonna have us walk through every single one of these um, but not so much by me looking, like showing you, oh, you click this and it does that. I'm going to take a little bit of a step back 
Um, and I put together a whole PowerPoint that breaks every single one of these down, not as a click by click kind of thing, but as a conceptual what actually happens, what what is happening that that is having you set that setting that way or the other way. So that's what I want to do over the next um, couple of hours. OK, so we're going to walk through every one of these settings, starting with the initial settings. Um, and then I'm going to I'm going to talk about what 2D products we can get. I'm going to talk about what 3D products we can get and how and why we set these settings a certain way. And that's really all there is to it. So you bring in your imagery. I'll show you how to do that. You go through these settings and then you hit start. At the end, I know, yes, I, I'll, I'll open it. This log is going to open when we hit start. And then at the end, you're going to get a report. So here's what you do if you have some of your own data from any, any project. But if you don't, it's OK, because you will have, I really encourage you to get this, this uh, virtual course done as soon as possible after this training so that it makes sense to you, OK? So that's going to be my homework. I'm not going to check you on the homework, but OK. So this is how it uh, drawn to map. You still see my screen, yes? yes. When you're yes. opening the program, this is what it looks like. It's very sort of black boxy. And this is why it, it is important to kind of talk about what goes on. So so it looks like this, OK? So when you if you have nothing open, or if you've never done anything before, what all you have to do is choose one of these options here on the left. You choose 2D Rapid. 2D full, 2D two dimension, or 3D mapping, okay? Again, if you have flown a mission, that's why I spent time last hour talking, if you have flown a mission with only one polygon, not an overlapping polygon or a two, right? You won't get a 3D product out of it, or, or it may not be very good. So, so you would do one of these 2D, but let's say we do a, so you've flown a, a project and you want a 3D product. You want to see this house in three dimensions. That's like exampled here. You would click 3D mapping. Okay. And the 3D mapping, this will show you that you're going to get a 3D point cloud and a 3D textured mesh. Now, does anybody know what any of that means? Probably not so much. You can intuit, but you may not be sure. So this is what you're going to get out. And this is what I want to talk about, what you're getting out. And then you would hit next. OK. And then it opens this screen. So if you have a project, just give it a name, test one or whatever. And then you would hit browse. And you would go to the folder that has your data. OK. So it's so essentially just find the project that has your data. Um, and I guess in my case, I would go say, this is the this is the Esri training that uh, that. Um, oops, sorry. What did I do? Oh yeah, no, sorry. That's where you save your project. So you can. Sorry, I, I made a mistake. So you it defaults to your C drive under users under your documents. It's going to make a drone to map folder, and within that folder is going to be a project. So you can leave it at that. And just know that you'll be finding your processed data under your documents in this folder, OK? And then you would hit click, uh, you would click Add Images, OK? You would add images, and that opens. So now you would go to the data that you have collected, OK? The, the way you get the data on here. And again, that's why we had an August 10 training, because we were going to go out in the field, collect the data, then we're going to come back sit down with that data you downloaded from the drone. I would help you figure out all you have to do if we don't do the training is take out the SIM card from your drone, put it into a card reader, put it into your computer, and navigate to that folder. That's all you have to do. So you would navigate to that folder exactly the same way. Um, right? I would go into the folder that has my data. It's called Riceville Beach Photos. And then what I do, here's a JPEG, right? Uh, so here's my photos. They were collected on this date at this time. So that's a little bit of information about that photograph. We call that metadata. So you would set, you would click the first photo. That's how I do it to get them all at the same time really quickly. And then, um, and then you can uh, hit Control A, and that's going to select all the photos. Okay. So that'll be all your photos, and then you hit OK. And then sometimes it's going to. This is then this is a weird thing about 
Um, it's going to ask for a GPS file, which I never have had to provide. So however they collected this data that is being loaded into that Esri training, I don't know. Uh, with my own data, I never had to do this. So normally you would select the photos, click OK, and then you'll get them in and you'll see the photos, right? So these, this is going to list your photos. This is the latitude, the longitude, so the, the, the location of where the photos were taken, the altitude at which the photos were taken, and the date. This is the basic metadata, the basic information needed to bring these photographs in. And once you have them here, you just hit create, and then you get this, the screen that I was showing you earlier, which is this screen here, okay? So if you have your own data, please go ahead and try bringing it in. Um, but that's that's all it takes. Okay, so I'm gonna go back now. Um, and as I said, as I gave you that initial walkthrough, um, I'm gonna close this now because that's I just wanted to show you how you get to that screen that I had. So the initial walkthrough I gave you was to highlight that this is what you're working with. It's not a very complicated program. It's a very simple, straightforward program with a contents tab, the actual map tab, this is the 2D map, and when you start processing your data, you're gonna be able to click on this 3D map and get your 3D map out of that. And then here is your actual processing sort of tab, right? But the but what you see here is very black box. This is incredible. This is one of the most black box programs, um, really, that exist. And what I mean by that is, you know, you click this initial, right? And you can have no idea. You can absolutely do this without having any idea why you set these. You still would get an orthomosaic. But if somebody starts asking you questions, you're not, you know, you're not going to be sure why you did what you did. But you're going to get a report that's going to tell you exactly what was done. But so with minimal input from your side, you can run through this by just clicking OK, accept all the default. You can accept the default and move on. And literally, I don't have to do anything right now. I can hit start, and it's going to process this, and it's going to give me an image. Okay, um, so that's really all there is to it. You load up your images, and you hit start. If that's all you, if if you are happy running with the defaults. Um, but let's let's walk through some of these very quickly and see why certain things are are there. And if you want to do more than the defaults, and if your students start asking you questions then you'd want to bring up something like this, okay? Um, so the initial project setup, that initial tab that I showed you there, initial. All that initial is, is you, 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 as you're setting up your project, is you're importing your photos. And what I said earlier is because these photographs are already geolocated, geo in front of any word simply means geographic, and that simply means that it is aligned in space with the real world locations. So all of these photos are usually going to be geolocated. So all you have to do is add them. And then um, sometimes you don't even have to select an output coordinate system. And this simply means if you want your data to come out in state plane coordinate system versus another coordinate system, then you would change it. But typically, whatever that, that whatever you're collecting, the, whatever coordinate system you're collecting your data in, and the options usually are latitude and longitude, UTM, which stands for Universal Transverse Mercator, or state plane, state plane coordinate system. If you work and live in North Carolina and you do work for any, any department, for North Carolina, I do a lot of work for the DOT. We always use state plane, the state plane coordinate system. You only have to set that once in your in your drone, in your whatever app you're using to collect the data. You set that app at first before you do anything else. And again, this is why we should get time in the field. And then whatever that coordinate system, whatever that reference to the real world location is that you set up, that's what you're gonna get your data out in. Okay, so depending on the imagery you're processing, and I'm gonna, I, I gave you guys this presentation as a handout, and it contains everything that you see here. We're not gonna go through everything. We're only gonna go through RGB because I'm assuming majority of everybody here 
um, is maybe just getting started and interesting, interested in, in RGB data. But there is the information and the explanations for all the uh, for multispectral and thermal in, in the handout. Okay, so depending on the imagery you're processing, you will use a different workflow and you are going to get out different products. Okay, that's basically all there is to it. When you process RGB imagery, what you would get with a Mavic Air, with a Mavic. Uh, sorry, with a, yes, Mavic Air, Mavic Mini, you would be getting RGB imagery. And what you can get out of that is an orthomosaic, a digital surface model, a digital terrain model, and a point to point cloud. Okay, so that's all I'm going to go over. And as I, it's kind of, I highlight, highlighted in the, pre, the previous sort of handout, we rely in doing all of this, everything that happens in drone to map in those tabs that you can modify or you can just leave them alone is a structure from motion algorithm, okay? A structure from motion algorithm, which is the remote sensing technique that uses photographs of an object or an area taken from multiple angles, whether it's at 90 degree or oblique, you're still getting the same area from multiple angles through the overlap to create a three-dimensional set of points that are essentially corresponding to the surface to whatever you're mapping. And that three-dimensional set of points is called a point cloud. Okay. And that point cloud we can then take and color with the RGB colors from our camera. But really what you're creating when you run drone to map is a point cloud. Okay, and this is what actually happens. <laughs> I know this might look a little daunting, but that's why I really think it's important for us to walk this, walk through this at least once. You put it away, you stash it away until you have to come back to it, come back to it, um, and essentially, you know, just make sure you understand what these roughly are, because you're not going to have to play with those settings too much. You're going to figure out something that works and you're going to go with that, what works, okay? But you still kind of have to, to, to get to have. So this is the workflow of what, what all happens, okay? From you bringing in those images to you getting out an orthomosaic and the, the digital terrain model, that bare earth topography, you, the software drawn to map walks through these steps. And the first step is to extract those key points um, and then we're going to go from there. Okay, so I'm going to walk you through these. These slides are named by exactly what I have in that workflow. So you can kind of reference yourself back to the workflow. So the key points. This I can't highlight. I can't stress how important it is. I've taught the class to undergrads and grad students for, like I said, about five years now. And once they get this, once they get the concept, it's like easy. If they don't get the concept, then they're just like monkeys pressing buttons. And you don't want monkeys pressing buttons. You want people that understand why they're doing what they're doing. Or at least that's how I teach my classes, right? I'm assuming everybody does it the same way. So key points. What are these? These are these spatial locations, these, these unique standout features that exist in all of the photographs. And again, overlapping photographs. One here, one here, one here, one here, one here, one here. For the same exact frog leg, I can see this frog leg from if I take the photo this way, if I take it this way, if I take the photo rotated. And oftentimes, if you get a gust of wind, this is this right here is how your photograph is going to look like because your drone may just like move a little sideways or it may do a funny turn and it's taking the photograph as it's turning and that photograph is gonna be rotated like that. The point with these key points, huh, the point with the key points um, is that they are visible. It don't matter how your image changes, how your scale changes or how that image is rotated, okay? But they still stand out and you can still, you can still see them. Okay, so then what happens, uh, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to probably, like, I'm going to come out of full screen share here because I want to keep coming back to drone to map, and I want to show you what, what, this, what this is. So in my initial settings, here I am in drone to map, okay? Here's the first setting you have to select, the key point image scale. 
What is that? Well, you have some options. You have full, you have rapid, and then you have something called custom image scale. And here you can choose. You can choose the whole image, twice the image, quarter of the image, you get the point, right? So this is your first setting. And this is what I'm talking about to you right here. First of all, hopefully everybody got what a key point is because you can't set the scale properly without understanding what it is. So what the key point image scale, which is why this slide is titled that, because that's exactly how the setting shows up in drone to map is the image size at which these key points are extracted from your image when compared to the original image size. So imagine that uh, this is, and this pertain, when I say image size, the original image size, I mean the individual image, right, that goes in here, this image. Um, anyways, so, so remember, each of these points is an actual image. And when I say that the image, the, the, the scale at which these key points are extracted relative to the original image, I mean that individual image. So what I said before is that the algorithm goes through each individual photo and finds these key points. And you see these little, uh, these little dots that show up here. They represent essentially um, one of these key points, one of these features that is easily identifiable in, a, in, in, the, whole, in the whole study area that I flew. And it, it uses that to create my initial point cloud. So if you are worried about how fast your processing is going to happen, then you choose something like a quarter image size, meaning that instead of the algorithm having to scan through the entire image to find interesting key points, you're telling the algorithm that you're satisfied for time for for speed of processing purposes if it just goes through a quarter of the image instead of the whole image okay if you end up collecting images that are blurry or that are less than ideal in 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 um, um in quality in texture or or what i mean by texture is if you happen to have to go fly say you're gonna go fly a pine plantation for a farmer out in North Carolina, because that's the project you're gonna do with your students. That is going to be, if you fly just a, uh, that pine plantation, that image, that data coming back is gonna have low texture in the sense that there's not gonna be a lot of sort of necessarily variability in there. So you're gonna have some problems processing it because it's gonna be hard for the algorithm to find unique points. These unique points usually exist when you have um, a road transitioning to a ditch, transitioning to uh, grass or trans something that something other than the same thing, right? The pine plantation is very homogeneous. So in those kinds of situations, you would use um, less than, than one original size uh, like that, a quarter or, or a half. Uh, because you, you have some issues that you're kind of trying to kind of mask out of that image. But if you have time and you have and you want to get the best possible product you possibly can, you can uh, go with a full image size, for example. So, so, so with your extracting um, from full, because you see this is your default, right? This is the default here. But it is important to know that you have other options if you're trying to speed up the processing or if you have some questionable data, okay? And then the next thing you see on here is matching image pairs, okay? So how do you, how, does, how do these images get mm, sort, of, so sort of matched across these individual, uh, individual collected pictures to create something that makes sense from this image to the next image, okay? And that, is essentially what happens next okay so again you don't have to uh, you will not have to remember this this the name of this um technique that extracts these key points but like i said this is going to be the longest amount of time that is spent on processing your data it's very very sort of computer memory intensive it's going to take up a lot of your cpu space for a while because this algorithm is going through each photograph, finding these key points 
um, that are relevant and that, 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 that can be identified irrespective of, again, the rotation of the data, how, how zoomed in or zoomed out they are or anything else. And they also don't, uh, they try to, they, they are usually not sensitive to illumination changes or even projection changes. Okay, so, so that's the algorithm. It's called scale invariant feature transformation. But once that process of the key point selection from whatever, from the full image or from a portion of the image, depending on how you set it, has been completed, then these key points, these key points that are just essentially millions of these little data points in a cloud, like you see here, here, and here, they get matched. So here's an example of what that means. Here is a, a, a church in this picture and the same church, but from a different angle. Remember, we're doing photogrammetry. We are resolving 3D objects from different angles. And this is just to show you that the next critical point in the algorithm is the matching of these key points between different pictures. Okay, so in, this would be obviously from a drone, but the idea is the same. Each individual little point pointing here to the turret, to this window, to this thing, to this thing, to the to the corner of this building, these are the key points, okay? These are the unique features that were identified. And then for these to become a point cloud that we can then make into a map, we have to match them across to the next image and to the next image and to the next image. So the key, so what happens here is the more of these key points from one image get matched over to the next image, then the better accuracy product you're going to get. You're going to have a product with, with more confidence, right? So you're going to know that the corner of the church here, which was one key point, is the same. So then that becomes two key points. And if I have another photo, that's three key points, again, in a point cloud of millions. All right, so back to here. So that's what this is, right? How do we match these image pairs across these key points? <clears throat> and typically, we're gonna use an aerial grid, right? So that's why I keep sort of stressing, you can do a free flight, but it's gonna be, I've never done it. I, I don't even know if it's accurate enough. I usually use an aerial grid. So I map a along a an aerial grid, um, and then once you select that, it essentially, um, you use the geometry to verify the matching, right? You're matching these image pairs, right? Using triangulation of your image geolocation. You're using capture time. You're using the distance between the photographs. You're using image similarities. Um, and then you're using um, a maximum number of image pairs. So you can set this of how many do you, how many you want, but you really don't have to. You can let that one default. So these are all the components that go into your image matching, okay? Um, and then, Usually these, these settings here, we kind of leave them alone, the targeted number of key points, you automatically, the more key points you have, the more key points are matched across the images using similarity, triangulation, distance, capture time, all of these, all of the information in your pictures, the better the product. So you just kind of want to let that, um, that be automatic. The other thing that, <clears throat> that I, I talk about that we sometimes set, but again, if you're, use, if you're doing fairly standard projects, you don't have to worry so much of the, about this thing called the calibration method. You can let it be standard, but when you go and fly that, and I keep using the pine plantation, or you go fly some fields that are fairly homogeneous in nature, the only way you're gonna get that data to stitch is if you use an alternative um, calibration method, essentially the, by calibration method, we mean, we mean how those images get matched across these key points, okay? So you're gonna get away and you're gonna be okay using standard, except when you have uh, something that is very homogeneous in nature. Um, so, so back to here, and then essentially, 
once these key points get matched, they become what we call automatic tie points. So they become these, these known points in the point cloud. There will be a simple way to explain this. this. And these, these automatic, you don't have to remember that they're called automatic tie points. They essentially just make the translation between um, that, that picture being up in the sky and where that picture corresponds on the ground. Okay, so, so it's making a little bit, of, it's beginning to make a translation from, because remember what I said in the beginning, you're flying at, 100, at, at uh, uh, 400 feet, say. You're getting your images up there, but you gotta be making that product to fit right on the ground, right where it was, right? And these tie points are based on, on those unique features called key points, is what, tie, what ties your points in the point cloud to the real world coordinates, okay? The things you're paying attention to is your key points image scale, how fast you wanna process that. And again, the only decisions you have to make here are based on two important things, how quickly you wanna process your data and what kind of surface you flew, okay? If you flew something that is very homogeneous in nature, you want to increase this as much as you can necessarily so that you get, you could even do double the image size to because if it's if your images are so homogeneous the software is going to have a hard time finding key points and finding matches between these key points so it's going to give you holes okay and the other thing you set is this the calibration method if it's if, if everything, if you have roads and the buildings and some trees, so if you have a mixture of things, standard is great. If you have homogeneous surfaces, you want to do um, alternative. And you always want to do the geometry verified matching, which simply means that you, you, they, they, they match up geometrically. Okay, and that's it. So that's your sort of initial settings that get us into, into the initial processing. So I think this is a good time for us to take a break. Uh, and then we'll come back and, and walk through the rest of these settings where it gets, um, you know, and come back to, to, to what all happens in the algorithm. How's that sound? Any questions right now? Uh, that sounds great. The only question I have was the, so under, just to me verify, so under the uh, key point scale image, the, uh, when it, uh, uh, you know, the original size image, if you're going to cut, if you're going to do customized images, um, under key points, if you do full size, it's automatically going to do its own thing. Right. Full images. If you yes. want to, so, but if you want to customize the image, the purpose for customized image, the larger the size of the image, the less details it's going to be and the faster it will take to do the compilation because it's not going to be as detailed. Yeah, so exactly. if you really want a good detail and you've got the time and the processing exactly. power, you want to make it as small yep. as possible. Yep. Right? Yep. Okay. Thank you much. Yep. So that's 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 all there is to it. But again, understanding what those key points are in the first place, I hope hopefully that's clear, right? That's really what I want to folks to get out of this part of it. The previous hour was at talking about key points which is the key, <laughs> the key point of a lot of the processing that goes on, right? Incidentally, they're called key points. Um, and the fact that, that in the processing workflow that I showed you back here in the beginning, and everybody has access to these, to these resources. If you have any questions as you start working through these, you have my email, so please feel, feel free to reach out. But as we're looking at drone to map, I want to step through these sort of uh, steps that build on each other that are very important components. So we have now made it to about right here where these key points are extracted from the image. They're identified. They are being matched among the images. So the same exact key point. Think about the key point as a building, the corner of a building, not the building itself, not the whole building. It would be the corner of a building, the corner of a sidewalk walk, the intersection between a sidewalk and the road. So small, small things like that, because we need a lot of them, right? We need a lot of them and they get matched across multiple images because we've established that that's why we fly with an overlap to be able to match these things across multiple images, to be able to get those multiple lines of sight pointing to the same thing. And then, and then 
um, the, the, the workflow does the matching, does this matching between sort of your images in the sky and where they, it begins to sort of figure out where that, see this key point in the image right here, the black little arrow in this image and the black little arrow in this image, those are my key points in the image. And then um, the software begins to, to plop that down on the ground. See it at the intersection between this sidewalk and this sidewalk, exactly what I just said. So, so that's the next sort of step in the process. And then, and then once these key points have been identified and they've kind of been plopped back down to where they belong on the ground, the software does something that you, again, you don't have to remember the terminology, but it's there, you'll see it. It'll show up in your report at the end. It's called bundle block adjustment. So these, all of these key points, they get turned into these automatic tie points that tie between the key points and the ground, and then they get bundled, sort of, they kind of get split up in, they get bundled, meaning they sort of get split up on regions in the imagery. So if you have a large area, you're gonna get a bundle of these key points that belong, that, that can be resolved from say the images in this corner of your study area, and you're going to get a bundle over here, a bundle, right? So it kind of splits up the study area into these areas where most of the key points get matched and resolved sort of regionally. And then there, there, there be, aside from these automatic tie points, the software now brings in some additional information, some camera parameters such as the position of the drone like this remember when you start when you study for the FAA you learn about the pitch yaw and uh, roll well that sort of information gets brought into the processing about now along with the overlap between the images to start reconstructing the scene so to start giving you an approximation of what that scene is going to look like and to create a what we call a low density or a sparse point cloud, okay? And this is all part of that calibration. Um, and I'm showing you this, What it, the, just ignore the thing on the right, uh, but this, this is what we were just talking about here in PIX4D with the calibration, okay? The calibration method. And I have it in here, so, so for reference purposes, so this calibration, it takes the raw images based on the camera settings and whatever conditions were going on or however your drone was was facing and, and rolling and pitching and yawing right and then um adjust so adjust the images relative to all of this information um and relative to the location of your key points and as i said the main choices that we usually go with is the standard which is the default and it works great or um you can do that alternative calibration when you have imagery that is low in texture, or there's not a lot of variability and or blurry, okay? So once that's completed, the next stage, like I said, we've already finished with this screen here um, in, in Drone to Map, and that once we start processing, we, we're not processing right now because we haven't set everything else, um, then, uh, we are ready to kind of go to the next step, uh, which oftentimes, if you bring in GCPs, that's where you would be bringing in GCPs. But I'm not, like I said before, I'm not necessarily talking about that uh, because chances are you are not going to be doing this right now as you're starting off. So just ignore the GCPs for now. It's a little, it's not complicated at all. You just need to have that, that, data set which we don't have so after we get this low density point cloud right from the initial processing look what the next step is the next step is called the dense okay so dense is exactly what i have here in my in my slides and it's called the point cloud densification so this is the step where we take that low density or sparse point cloud that i just talked about and we essentially fill it in we fill it in by um, collecting additional collecting and creating additional points from from the imagery collected so so once those coordinates were determined 
um, between the sort of the same points in the in the image and on the ground, then we can calculate that 3D position um, and choose an image scale to densify the point cloud. So the at this point, the the software goes through your data again and it fills in the gaps. So this is a, an example, a sparse point cloud that just gives the just gives the the software what it needs to start building the scene for us and then it kind of the, the software goes through your image again and it creates additional these these additional 3d points the same idea with the same idea here at the different image scale a full or half image scale usually give us good results but larger image scales in this case increase the processing time just like we talked about before um, and when you have features that cannot be easily matched, when you have veg sorry, heavy vegetation, again, homogeneous features, you can use quarter image scale um, when you have that difficult. But again, this next step here, this dense, that's what it does. It simply adds more data to your image. So it defaults on half image size. So it's, it's a good compromise between speed of processing and works. it works with sort of any kind of data. So even if it's not really great data, it's still gonna do a good job. Again, um, the, 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 the slowest is your original Im image size. It's gonna go through, again, the entire image, try to, try to match, try to rematch, try to create these additional 3D points. It's just gonna be the slowest, okay? So that's really the only decision you have to make there. Um, and then again, you have, you can set what point density you can have. And it's so easy here in drone to map because they've labeled everything. So it's fairly straightforward. You can decide if you want optimal, very high point density. Again, it's gonna be slower or if you're okay with low point density. Um, you want at least three matches and that's usually the minimum that we, meaning that you want at least three matches before each key point. It's considered that if you can't identify a key point in an image and match it to at least three other images, it's not a reliable key point necessarily. It's not gonna do good things for you in your final, um, final product. And that's it. I mean, this is your densification stage, right? Again, back to my, to my slide, we have made it to number eight. We have created a dense point cloud, okay? Um, and then, in the process of doing this dense point cloud, um, we have the option. So, so we would click OK here, and we would feel good about these settings. Okay, and then our next, um, our next sort of stage of processing is okay. Now we get to decide, you know, what products we want to get out of this and what kind of data format we want those products to come out. So the first sort of product that you get out of this processing is a point cloud, right? Because we keep talking about this. All it is, all we get from this photogrammetry from these drones is a point cloud of these key points and where the images were and the camera parameters, all of that. We can export, we can bring that out um, as an, an LAS, file, uh, which is uh, what we would use essentially if you wanna say, bring this into AutoCAD or give it to an engineer, you would give them that file and they would do whatever, everything else they need to do with it. But then the other things that we get out of this, textured meshes and other 3D products, I wanna spend a little bit of time and kind of look at. So I'm gonna come back into my PowerPoint here for a minute to show you what all these different products are. What one cool feature of drone to map is that in the process of densifying the point cloud, it also can classify the point cloud. And I started off this morning by talking about why we usually do mapping. And why do we usually do mapping? It's not just for the sake of making maps, but we usually do mapping so that we can take the complexity of the real world around us and usually segregate it into into something that we can make sense of because there's so much going on out there that we usually have to classify things out oftentimes we just want to map out 
um, roads or buildings or uh, lawns, right? Depending on the application. So we can classify. So there's the, the software essentially classifies your point cloud at the point after it gets densified. And that's a, that's a useful feature in and of itself or it can be because it, it'll tell you what's trees, what's what's grass, like in this image here. The green is trees and the yellow is grass and the gray is the road, right? So it's useful to see that really quickly. And then it also helps make better products and I'll show you, right? Um, so these are the, 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 the cloud, the formats that you get, the LAS files, the LAZ. So these are all um, files that and again, I have some of my screenshots here from, from Pix4D, not to confuse you, but um, I can change these over to, to drone to map and send an updated file, but um, to show you that, that these are standard across whatever software we use. Um, and then we're going to have that. So the next product that we get out that we kind of get to decide on in here is a textured mesh. You see it? So once I, once I select, if I want, you don't even have to get this. You can unclick these. If you don't even care ever about looking at the point cloud, there's no reason to create it because it's just going to take up space on your computer. Typically, you really don't need it if all you really want is a map and a 3D product. Um, so then you would go to your textured mesh and the textured mesh is a surface that is essentially made up of little tiny triangles that unite the points in the cloud. OK, so so it's just like taking your densified point cloud that was just a series of points and starting to build an image file out of it. So it's putting it's it's doing the triangulation that we talked about earlier in between these points and it's making little little triangles. And that's the beginning of us making a 3D product. Um, and it's, it does it in I such a way. Say, yes. Can I ask you a question? I, I, did I hear you say? The, 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 there, there is really, if we're not planning to export this, uh, the, the, um, the point clouds, we don't need to create them. Is that what no. you said? Because it, it just takes time to process. Yeah, no. It I adds a it. bunch of time to process, right? I mean, it's exactly. a lot of process. So we don't need so to put them in there. This is what I'm saying. Yeah, you can yeah. come see, see. So look at all these files, that, uh, these, again, if you're not giving this to an engineer, right you really there's no reason for you to do this because you're not going to use it so so any of these things that you don't recognize that you don't really think you need just in in this section with your textured mesh and the point cloud just unclick them don't make them don't do them if you want to give it to an engineer you would make an autocad file and you right. would give them that autocad file directly but i would just not even do any of these if, uh, although it is nice to 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 do to do a little mesh because you can actually kind of play around and look at it in the software just you know to, to but you're not going to need it as a product so the the three the final products that you're going to necessarily want out of this you do want to classify their point clouds you never want to take this off because it helps make a good final product if you let it classify the point clouds um, and you definitely always want to merge these files because what did I just say? Tiles. What I said earlier is that that the the image, the area you're mapping, is going to get broken down into these bundles. Think about them as little tiles in the image, like tiles in on a on a tiled floor, right? So you want to mer merge them back together at the end, so you get only one product. You don't have to go back and like stitch them again. So you want to merge those, but that's basically really all you want to do um, on on that end of things. Um, and then and then the other products that that you tend to get after the textured mesh is going to be your digital surface model. Now notice something in my file, in my, in my options here. Do I have an option to do anything other than what, what I saw, what I showed you? A mesh and a product, uh, an actual classified point cloud. So I'm gonna hit apply to these settings, okay? And I'm hit, gonna hit okay. Now I don't have the option of getting my DSM, which is a digital surface model, right? A model of what was in the image when I flew and any objects on it, like buildings, like cars, like trees, all of that stuff. 
makes up what we call a DSM, a digital surface model, okay? Under, anything that's underneath of everything that was on the ground when I flew is gonna be called a digital terrain model, right? DTM or bare ground. So it, it's gonna remove the buildings, the vegetation, poles, telephone poles, power lines, all of that. And it's just gonna give me what the topography, what the ground looked like. From this, I can obtain contour lines. And this is what you know engineers use. A lot of times, the, the, one of the biggest markets for using, as you know, drone surveys, right, is construction. And, and then sort of engineering, planning, this is what they want. They're gonna want this DTM, this digital terrain model. Now notice again that I went through all of my settings here, right? And I, I unclicked my point cloud, so it's gone. See, it's gone off of here. And I'm under my 3D products. And I don't see any, I don't see the two products that people are usually super excited about, the DSM and the DTM. Any guesses as to why in this case? I don't have those options. Oh, should I take that as a no answer? I hear you. I'm, I'm going to say, because I would assume that it's a, it's a default because you, everybody wants it. So why would you ask for it? Why would you not get it in this case? That's right. Well, I said it earlier that you're going to get it or you're not going to get it, depending on how you fly your mission. And didn't I say that this is why we should be going out in the field and doing this? I will come back and give you a clue because this is uh, this is important. Like I said, you're gonna go fly these missions and you're gonna come back thinking you're gonna get that and you're not gonna get it if you don't plan it right, which is why I spent so much time talking about it. This is your clue right here. The, 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 the reason is this, see how this flight was flown? It was a single grid I, I flew one line this way, I turned and I flew back and I landed. I just basically flew a polygon with a ov side overlap, longitudinal overlap, but I didn't fly a perpendicular polygon on top of it, which is the clue here. See, you need a double grid if you want to get a 3D model out. And that's kind of important. Right, so if you fly just a grid like this, like a simple grid over an area, you're just gonna get a 2D map because you don't have enough of those oblique visual sort of lines to reconstruct a, a, a good or any 3D model. You're flying all, uh, all sides yes. of a building instead of just uh, one side, the north side, and when you do, and go back the other way now you're exactly. getting now you're getting exactly so you need to get all of those all of those angles from not only flying north and south and back right so this would be flying whatever north to the south and south back to north you're going to get a nice map of this area it's going to be great you guys hopefully will get a chance to go through this training and finish this and see your final product but you're not going to have the 3d product because you didn't go over it the other way as well okay so this is this this i wanted to kind of really get to this point and really drill it down and that's why i spent time on mission planning and on going over this and you know i kept saying over and over again if you want a 3d model out of your data you gotta fly it from multiple angles and the best way to fly it from multiple angles is to do an overlapping or a perpendicular grid over it like this like shown here you see what i'm showing showing here just just a sec so what i'm showing here is see I, i'm flying this tiny area the white lines are me going over this area like this north to south the black grid is the same flight it doesn't take that much time it, it doubles your time a little bit it's basically it's double the time but you're going over the same area now perpendicular okay yes please Adding, um, when the image um, is emerged, will they be on the GPS location? Is that how it's going to make it 3D? 
Yes, so it's going to make it 3D from the GPS locations and from from the same area being being photographed from multiple sides, right? Like this and like this and like this. Yes. But Thank the, you. the GPS points is yeah, what allow us to do that 3D map and to to make the model, but again, you can't with that data because you just didn't collect it in such a way. So it's just a matter of remembering when you go out in the field, you, you might have to survey less, you might have to survey a smaller area. But if you're using the, the Aloft app, it doesn't matter what you're using, just make sure you're using an overlapping grid to ensure that at the end of the day, you're going to get your 3D model, okay? So, um, so yeah, so I just kind of wanted to wrap up and then the last the last stage you get out of all of that is an orthomosaic, so an image like that. An orthomosaic are those all of those individual images that we just kind of went through and did the key points and did all of that, right? That were that were matched across, um, and we get this final mosaic, this final stitched image from that digital surface model, right? And we correct it for perspective and so on and so forth. Um, um, and we do the color balancing to make it look visually pleasing and so on and so forth. Now, when you do, when you collect data that will give you a good 3D model, th there are two other settings that you would have to, to set. And I just want to quickly touch on them. Um, and, and those are going to be, so here's an example of what a, what, a, what a 3D model can look like. When you see areas like this over here, see how this is essentially um clearly not not looking so so good over here these uh, these are your little triangles from these meshes i was talking about that are basically trying to fill in the gaps here see i have a hole you see the hole here in my image you can visually see it when you get a dsm or a digital surface model and you see these sort of flat line areas you basically these are place place areas of no data. These are areas where your algorithm did not do a good job of giving you a reliable surface model. So you, you can't really use that, right? But over here, you can see the road, you can see the ditch along the road, you can see another road coming in. You see some, there are some short trees here, grass with some interspersed trees and some thicker trees. You notice, like I've been saying, when you start getting into dense canopies where there's just a, a lot of the same stuff, you're not gonna be able to resolve that. You're not gonna get, be able to get a good product out of that. And hence, we have these kind of gaps here in the data. But when you make these um, surface models, you can filter them, you can filter out some of the noise, right? And then you can smooth them. So you can you can put a filter on it. So this is what it looks like with no filter. If you it's like a filter when you take a selfie and you you apply a filter to it. Same kind of concept here, except it's kind of done on pixels on 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 these on these data instead of well, done on pixels and photos. And then the other so that's the, those are the two things: noise filtering and surface smoothing. Now you have to be careful when you use smoothing as a technique to clean up a, a data set as you assume, right, um, you, can, you can lose some detail at the expense of that image being smoother. So it depends what you need. The other choice that you have to make when you generate a digital surface model is which interpolation method is being used. Meaning, when I go between all the key points in my image, like shown here, and I create a mesh, like I do that triangulation, the little triangles between all the points, right? How those, those triangles then get turned into this. And this, <clears throat> this is essentially a type of file that we, we call the raster, R-A-S-T-E-R. -E so when we create this raster, and the raster is essentially just an image that covers an area seamlessly. So instead of having an area like this, which would be very hard to deal with 
you know, mapping software with holes and with things happening vertically and horizontally and you, you essentially it's it's a it's a more difficult type of file to deal with when you make one of these smooth raster data sets like this or like this you take all of those points in the point cloud and you connect them together and you fit a surface in between them and that is called interpolation. So just like when you interpolate between information you receive from this friend to that friend to that friend to make a story that fits seamlessly, same thing here. You take the points in the point cloud and you it's essentially like fitting a rubber sheet in between your points to make a, one complete sort of file that covers your area. So that's interpolation. So we can do that interpolation in two ways, by using something called inverse distance weighted, which is an algorithm that essentially takes, by it's called inverse distance, because the closest two points are together, the more likely they are that they will be stitched together, okay? So that's why inverse distance weighted, because we, we weigh how we connect the points together based on their distance relative to one another, right? So things that are closer together are more alike than those that are farther apart. And anytime you are flying a built environment, a place that has buildings, bridges, whatever, you want to use IDW as your interpolation method for making a DSM, because it's gonna be able to, because you have such, sharp objects in your image, buildings, bridges, um, things that are, again, sort of geometric and sharp. It's able to sort of connect. So if I have a high point here at the top of my building and a low point, it's, it's kind of fitting a rubber sheet in between them and it's gonna make it look good and it's gonna be great. Now, on the other hand, if you are flying um, an area where you have a lot of tree canopy, a lot of crop canopy, Anything that, again, back to the same idea I keep talking about, a homogeneous area. And what you really want to be mapping out is a height of the trees relative to shrubs or something like that. Then you would use something called triangulation or, or, a, um, or a TIN, a triangulated regular network. And these are two settings you'll find in drone to map right? Um, and you will get a less smooth surface, as shown here, but it'll give you that uh, a distinct sort of a more distinct sort of differentiation or drop between things that are that otherwise don't have sharp edges. So this may come in handy. It, it, you know, I, I use I, I do a lot of work in Africa and a lot of work focused exactly on figuring out um, where certain vegetation types exist. And for those kinds of locations, it doesn't work to use IDW because I don't get any edges. So if you're, or any sort of, uh, anyways, distinction between things, okay? So that's kind of, those are the I two can, really- Can I ask a question? Yes. So I gotta ask a question. I, I, I really, for the last uh, five minutes or so, I've only seen the PowerPoint slide that says DSM generation. Is that what you've been only talking on? Because it sounded to me like you were pointing to something else and no, I didn't no, see it. I have, I have two slides that are called DSM generation, actually. One slide that talks about noise filtering and surface smoothing of these DSMs. And then the other slide talks about the method that is being used in the background. And again, you may not even care about this too much, but all you have to remember is you would use a different method to generate a DSM. If you flew an area with a bunch of buildings and sharp objects, then if you flew an area of trees and, and crops and things that are not um, heterogeneous. Yeah, that's all I was pointing to. So these two slides, they're called- the We didn't see the second slide. We only see the first slide. So you don't see this one right now that says IDW and- No, all we see says noise filtering. Oh weird well i keep no i'm sorry about that uh, well it's in the handouts it's slide number 22. okay yeah i see it i see, well, I see it on the, the hand slide out but uh, on the screen is only showing the the, oh. the first I, was, I know you were covering oh. what i wasn't seeing on the screen <laughs> oh no maybe we are running into the screen as you were you were talking oh i see wow that's weird um yeah i don't know why it's happening i was pointing to different things as i was explaining that 
Right, and that's what I was trying to figure out. I was thinking I didn't see the same thing you were talking about. Oh no. Okay. Well, <laughs> so that's 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 kind of it. And at that point, when you have gone through all of these settings, um, you just would hit go, or you can hit run on that product, um, and it's going to start um, start analyzing and computing your data. Okay. All right. Okay. So back here. So what? What? Um, so that's what I was just finishing up showing, right? In terms of your your sort of final products, your orthomosaic, right? Um, showing up here under your two D products, your digital surface model and and the digital terrain model. So I, I had started processing, but I kind of stopped it. So that's why I'm getting all these red exclamation points here. Uh, so let's see if I open the options for that. There it is. So that's kind of what I was talking over, but for some reason it didn't open for me at first. So now it's able to open for me. Um, so what I was just, can you see my screen? Is it showing now? Uh, yes, I can. And, and so the question is back to the resolution. Uh, the resolution, can you explain that again? I'm, I don't know. So yes, so the resolution. So this is my um, let's see. So this is my ortho mosaic. This well, let's start not with the ortho mosaic because then let's start with the digital surface model because that's the one that I talked about the most, right? So you can hit more options, and here's your options. So with this digital surface model, what I what I was showing over here, right? Then I said that you have to make some choices here, and these are some important choices. You will choice. You will choose which method will be used. You see inverse distance or triangulation. Okay, so those are the methods. Now the resolution is, is any time you create an ortho mosaic and a digital surface model, you're not gonna get the two centimeters per pixel necessarily. And why is that? It's because the, the what, I sort of explained this before, the GSD, you see the GSD coming back to us, the ground sampling distance. Right. The ground sampling, this, the sampling distance that is determined by two things, the, the altitude at which you fly and the focal length of the camera. Now the fo that, that bit with the focal length of the camera, you can control. Whatever camera you have on your drone, that's what it is. So you can control the height at which you fly and that's gonna give you two centimeters, three centimeters, four centimeters. However, when you make these final products, I said that there's going to be interpolation. There, there's going to be essentially filling in gaps. So, so it's going to default to usually, um, you can do it sort of the same as the ground sampling distance uh, for the ortho mosaic, but for some of these other products, you, typically it's going to default at about five. So five times the ground sampling distance. So, so your digital surface model may be five times two centimeters and maybe 10 centimeters. Okay, so that's what it defaults at. Now you can change it, you can bring it down. It's gonna take a longer time to process, same kind of thing, right? And, but that's essentially the ultimate, the final resolution you get out of your data. So you can modify that. If you put it at one, it's gonna come out the same as the ground sampling distance, meaning the highest possible centimeters per pixel you can get. It's just going to take way longer to process. So that's why when you open this, it's going to default always. It's going to always default at five. So five times the ground sampling distance. You can bring it down or you can bring it up to speed up the processing. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. So that's your ortho mosaic. That's your digital surface model. And that's your digital terrain model. And again, so for the digital surface model, what I said, there are two things, noise, filtering, surface smoothing, or and the method at which you are creating that. Built environments use inverse distance, vegetation, agriculture use triangulation. And then you, you can choose to use or not noise filtering. As I, like I said, it depends. If you want a nice smooth image, you can do sharp, medium, or smooth. The the um, so that it'll give you like a little sharper edges and then again you can put out like I had in one of my slides you can put out contour lines if this is being used for sort of planning purposes building purposes and lastly the digital terrain model see how this defaults at six times the ground sampling distance I said nothing 
right? And again, it's because because it's trying to to aggregate some of your pixels into a bigger pixel so that you can so that it processes a little bit faster and that it tries to fill in any gaps you may have in your image. That's why it always defaults at higher than one to one. It's like a one to one you defined. And the same thing here, you can get contours of only the terrain of the bare earth. Okay. So those are those are those last settings that I talked about. So when you're done with setting up all these settings, um, you know, you can hit go with uh, with that. Okay, so there you are. So at the end of the day, what you want to see coming out of this is in terms of your 2D products, you, you want an orthomosaic, a digital terrain model, and a digital surface model. And in terms of your 3D products, you want a mesh, and you may or may not want a point cloud. Okay. Um, so seemingly now, for some reason, it's very interesting. Earlier, it, it, it was acting like it wasn't going to give me a digital terrain model and a digital surface model. It's going to give them to me. They're going to be what they're going to be. Um, so you're still um, you're still going to get them. But if you really want to get high accuracy, sort of really more defined a building view from multiple angles, then you would do that perpendicular flight pattern that I was talking about. And so once you get once you hit start and this finishes processing and this is going to take a while, even though this is a very small flight, you can expect at least half an hour, then you would click here on on the 3D map and you will be seeing all your products. They will show up here in the contents tab one by one. You can take them off and, and put them back on. Can you tell us what the uh, what is the recommended? I know we can read the information uh, on this line, but in your experience, Yes. What would you typically expect uh, the type of power for the PC to be? Oh, you know, I mean, a certain amount of memory, certain amount of processor speed. That's a good question, and I'm very glad you asked this. This is the last thing I wanted to go over. So, so over here in the options. So again, this is your this is your sort of key. So click options, and then if you click on well, the coordinate system is what I was referencing before, that it's going to take in the image information and it's going to give you out um, what coordinate system and you can change that. But what you are asking about just now is that. So the resources tab, the very last tab down here, it's going it, to it shows you where your project is located, where your images are coming from, where all your data processing notes are going to go. So these are your locations. So these are the logs that you create, but it's very important that you don't use your entire CPU of your computer. I have actually damaged the laptop. I basically destroyed the laptop early on in my early ages um, stages of processing data because I let the laptop go use all my CPU threads, okay? And it was working really hard and I also had it sitting in a, in a position that it overheated and I basically just killed my kill my my laptop. So it's advisable that I usually reduce it down by two threads. So if you have eight CPU threads on your computer, six, try not to run the processing at full CPU threads, okay? Because it, it could damage your machine. So that's in my experience, uh, you know, important thing to, to do. And of course, if you bring down how many CPUs are available on your machine to run the processing, it'll take a little bit longer. But how long it takes depends on how big of an area you're processing. So once you set that, you can hit OK. And then um, feel good that you're still giving your computer, because if you're still doing emails or you're doing something else on your machine while you're processing, you want to give it a little bit of resource to work off of that isn't being used for processing the data. That's good because it it will kill you. I mean, really, lock yeah, you yeah. up tight as a wedge. You can't. I mean, there's nothing else. You might as well walk away. And again, if I got like I got, I did a, a map. It took me 20 minutes to map it. I'm not sure how many images there are. A lot of images. I mean, basically, eight hours and it was still running. I mean, oh yes. 
I mean, sometimes I say 30 minutes conservatively because that's a really small area that you're going to be processing as part of this this exercise. But it probably is going to be even longer than that. And like I said, a large part, a large portion of that will go into your your first your initial processing, the key points and the key point matching and all of that. So you you want to you. You set it overnight or or really, but be careful not to use your, the entire power of your computer because you can fry it. So that's a real good point for us as teachers yes. as we're trying to develop uh, uh, projects for our students. What would you say is going to be a, to, to, for them to be able to legitimately get a 2D or 3D image that we can use to evaluate, uh, what would a minimum number of points data points be you know i mean uh because uh, again we're planning to use we'll need to use for 3d images we'll need to use the uh you know the um the the, the cross the grid the overlapping, pattern. The overlapping grid pattern yeah right so what would a minimum a good number but not so much that's going to take us forever to run it okay. yeah, be yeah. a good I'll number yeah, so I, I teach the class, like you say, and I take our students and I break them up into groups and I go with them in the same area. I send them, I separate them out by at least a uh, few hundred, solid few hundred meters. And what I do is I have them fly at different elevations. So I have a team fly at 400 feet and I have a team fly at 200 feet. I make sure. So, and then you don't have to, it doesn't have to be a big area. It doesn't really, honestly, uh, even a 500 foot by a 500 foot grid will do because you're still going to end up with over 200 images so it's not the don't think about it in terms of how many images because you're not necessarily going to be able to to um estimate how many images you're going to have but think in terms of when you set up your mission like this see how it tells me right here it's 241 by 270 75 meters right that's about no, no. That's about a thousand by twelve hundred feet. That's that's enough. And you're doing an overlapping grid on that. You are going to have no problems. And then the grand scheme of things, this is a very small area, but it's plenty to teach students how to fly, how to get the data, how to process the data. And it, and and it stays within one battery on a Mavic or a Phantom, right? Because the battery. You know, I usually don't even get close to the 27 minutes or whatever they say on some of the Mavics, right? I keep all my flights at top 20 minutes. And and it's easy when you set up the flight pattern, you know, there's no minimum number of photos. It can be a very small mission. Sometimes I do three minute missions. Overlapping three minute grid missions will give you enough data to process. Okay, that was my question. So yeah. the point is that we can fly missions that are five minutes, 10 minutes at the most, yeah. yes. and to get enough data to do a 2, 3, 3D map without yes. any trouble. Absolutely, yes. You don't even need to do more than five minute mission. It can be small, sweet and small. It doesn't matter. Right. They're, they're gonna process fast and you're gonna have enough images. Okay, and that's what we wanted to, that's, and that's really the key because again, uh, you, you know, you wanna be able to, because uh, uh, this is not gonna be now, you know, if we wanna do a major project for them that they're gonna be able to work on over time period, you know, that's a different story. You know, like we have a, a, a capstone project at the end mm -hmm. type thing. You know, they could, we could all set them up for a particular, uh, like my, my example would be that we, uh, we fly a, like example, we got a ball field here in Smithfield that has uh, four, four, it's got four fields with one uh, center building that oversees the fields for, you know, announcer stuff. So you can yeah. fly the fields and fly the, the, uh, the building and then everybody do the same thing and then you can run yes. through everybody should basically come back with the same results Absolutely. typically yeah 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 it's but well if they fly at the same exact elevation and everything else but right. yeah sometimes yeah no absolutely it doesn't have to be there is no minimum size as long as you're getting some kind of variety in that in that area that you're flying like i said but that makes it easier for the teacher my point being oh, too yes. is that you fly the same if everyone flies the same and matter of fact you could set it up through uh, like a loft drone link, whatever, the same mission. And since they're running it through a loft, they can bring up that mission and run the exact same mission. I mean, 
you know, because they hit the button and it's going to go, right? I mean. <laughs> well, yeah, but I like to let the student, I like to let them make the mission in the field because that's part of learning how, right? It's, it's easy enough and it can be a little bit different unless you really are holding them to a quality standard that cannot vary. But because at the end of all of this, you're going to get a quality report that you can click on and you'll see exactly what settings everybody used. So, so that's, a, that's a way that they could be graded on. Did you use, the, did you actually modify some of the settings? And you can, can go to the report and see what settings they used. So they don't have to be necessarily, but yeah, if it's easier, they can use the same exact everything. Okay, so you saying the report part is that um, uh, so where do you find the report uh, for yes. uh, drawing so, the map? So when this is finished, it's gonna the report is going to so all of this information, right? Because I, I I was showing you here, so options. So if you go right. to resources, um, everything will be in this location. I see. So at the end, when you're done, all you gotta do essentially is click on that location, and the report will be right here. See. It says report. Oh, so then essentially at the end, if you want to then bring these products that you just made, then you want to bring these products, say, into ArcGIS, then everything will be right there. You'll have project, project, you can reopen the project, you'll have products, and then you'll have the report. Okay which the report will show up as a PDF. It'll just be a PDF that can be open, but I, I haven't run this particular project right now. Uh, but the, the, the report will have everything exactly broken down like this, following this workflow. That's why I, I sort of spent my time here, because when you go back to the report, it'll have key points key point matching, ATPs, bundle blocks. So all of these names I have in here that seem like a lot of detail, they are all exactly what happened in the software and exactly what you're gonna see in the report. And it's gonna say, okay, this is a, this is a good, and I'm sorry that I had this run and I don't, I don't know where, where, where I put it. Um, I had done this back in May, uh, but again, it's just gonna look like, like that. And it's just gonna show you a preview of your products and, it'll tell you what your final spatial resolution was, basically. But yeah, you can find it here in, in the folder that, that, that stores everything about that project. Okay, we have, uh, we have about five minutes left on this segment. Um, the, uh, uh, the, I mean, if we needed to go over, by the way, it does allow you to go beyond the time for it shuts off. But the question is, so now, so you've covered everything then with the report? Yes. Yeah. So we want to open it up for any questions that anybody may have, turning your microphone on and ask the question. Most of you I see have had the ability to ask the question. So if you have a question, now's the time to ask it. Uh, these these sessions have been, rec are recorded and will be available probably in a day or so. They're putting them up pretty fast on the site so you can go back and review the information. Uh, there are, again, uh, there is additional training that is available for the drone to map, as a drone to map. If you're interested in that, please contact me uh, directly. Uh, my email was already in there. I think I'll stick it in here again. Uh, we are in the process of, of planning that sessions. We will be planning some other sessions as we go forward. Uh, the Our second level drone course uh, is aligned to Ezra Drone to Map is one of the requirements for the course. Um, so we are going to be, that's going to be something that, that you need to know. Um, let me put my name in here in case you don't have it. And I would say that it would be, I would really strongly encourage people to do this really, the, the web course. Uh, and again, it's not necessarily going to explain everything, but it's going to walk you through the steps, the step, click this button, click this button. Um, and and that, that'll be a really good practice right away after you've done this, if you can find the time. Great presentation. And um, I, I, would, I would think that uh, you've got the uh, four hour version. Now's the time to get out and just fly, map and go in and start doing some work, even though it may be wrong, at least going through the process of trial and error. And you're gonna have these videos to go back and review as well. Is that your recommendation? 
Yeah, I would say I think that the best or if folks want to practice on data, I have a, a lot of these really small projects that I used in my classes. So if folks would like, um, I'll put my email in the chat that they would like data to test on, to work on before going and flying themselves. I can send a link to, to these smaller data sets in addition or after you do the one that I keep that I point to in the ISRI virtual training. If, if people want more data sets, like small data sets to work with, I'd be happy to provide some. That's great. Wonderful. Bill Lewis has a question. Just, yeah, well, just one comment. Uh, everything that was covered here can be applied to like uh, law enforcement and crash scene reconstruction. So they use 3D modeling. Yes, yes, yes. Way. So, yeah, so I just you know, want you to know that expand this beyond just landscapes. Yes, and, of course. So, so the yeah, if you use for for scene rec reconstruction, you probably would do a circular fly flyover, but it would be processed exactly in the same way. You're not going to get an ortho mosaic, a map, but you're still going to get the 3D product 